the meeting to order. Um, the first item is public input, and I see no one. So the next would be the student report, Elizabeth Barrett from the class of 2020. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Barrett and I'm a current junior. So recently, the North Reading High School Science Department along with like our Science Olympiad Club has um, been doing a lot, like emerging the different schools in the district. So this past Wednesday, October 24th, was our first STEM, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, science, technology, engineering, and math um, night. And it was run by the members of Science Olympiad, the overall North Reading High School Science Department, and then partnerships with the Amazon Robotics Program and Fidelity. Um, so high school students presented their work at numerous displays. So teachers basically picked high school students with like past projects they admired and had them come and like speak about them at different stations. And then um, it was really good because like the high school students obviously got to teach some of their younger um, students in the North Reading District uh, new information that they like obviously haven't learned yet because they haven't made it to the same level of education yet. But also like the superiors were there, like the teachers were there, and then some of the representatives from these companies that were able to also give their input. And like, I'm a member of Science Club, um, like our Science Olympiad treasurer, so I know that like it helps us when we're going to uh, compete at the Olympia competition in the spring, because getting the input from teachers now and like really working through all the problems in our displays and like our models, like really goes a long way. So we're stepping with our best foot forward when we enter that competition. Um, the early action deadline is this Thursday, no November 1st. So a lot of the seniors are uh, rushing to finish up their first round of applications. Um, the business clubs of North Reading have really recently been involved in DECA. So this is like an international business program for um, like states around the world, uh, around the United States. And um, recently we had a representative come in and talk to the business classes about what DECA is. And um, we had a handful of students from uh, who are a part of FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America, like a club that we have here, actually attend that conference. And they absolutely loved it. Mrs. Pierce is the one who organized it. And she said it was like, went fantastic. So I know she's meeting with Mr. LaPrette about uh, furthering our involvement with that program. And then um, on October 13th, we hosted testing here for the PSAT for current sophomores and juniors. And uh, this hasn't been announced yet, but we recently got our votes in yesterday for our November Teacher of the Month. So that's gonna be Mr. Emerton. He teaches World uh, AP US History and um, US History Two for freshmen. Um, for Fine Arts Matters, the Maskers is doing stuff in music for this year. And at the end of September, I know Mr. Bernard saw North Reading graduate Andy Tai, is that how you pronounce his last I name? I did, yes. yes. Um, at the North Shore Music Theater in um, Jacqueline and Hyde. So that was really cool, like getting to see someone who graduated here in like a real um, f um, like mass scale production. Um, for athletics, the football team, they won their sh third straight Cal Kinney title, but unfortunately they lost to Revere in the playoffs 20 to 27 um, this past Friday at home. The North Reading Bar Girls Varsity Soccer ended their season today with a record of 14 and seven and the boys varsity soccer ended um, their season last Friday with us with six, 10 and two. Um, and, but then this year, North Reading High School is once again named that by the MIAA 2018 honor roll um, in recognition of no game disqualifications in 2017-2018 sports, sports year. And this just shows how North Reading students are setting a good example both on the field and obviously off the field um, in their classes. So for other events going on at the high school, um, members of the student council who currently serve as officers attended officer shop uh, workshops on October 12th. So we actually, since we have two members of our student council on our state board, which is uh, Mary Madden and Duncan McNeil, they actually got to present workshops and we, um, some of our North Reading students actually attended theirs and absolutely loved them. So they've really progressed so much with that program. Um, so also student council's food drive is currently in full swing. We're trying to reach our goal of 5,000 items by Wednesday. And it's pretty ambitious. We're currently at 1,500. And um, today actually members of the student council went to the food drive ourselves during power block. And we like brought all of our current donations to clear up space in the high school and like organize them and then package them and put them on the shelves just to make sure like we're really like helping them like from point A to point B and not just like giving them the food but actually like giving our time to them which I think really went a long way. Um, and we also recently helped the Hood uh, School 
jumpstart their own food drive. We uh, collected 200 items prior to our food drive and brought them down there ourselves just to give them like a beginning st boost. Um, tomorrow, North Reading Student Council has their monthly teen tech tutors event where we go and help out the senior citizens work um, their electronic devices and their mobile devices for an hour. That's uh, in partnership with Ms. Sherry Greer. She, she has a, her daughters um, went to the high school and she's always super kind for us and super flexible at times. So we're really grateful for that. Um, this Friday, it's Kids Night Out, which is run by Student Council. So be sure to sign your kids up if you haven't already. Um, it's $20 per uh, child and then $40 per family. And you can also sign up at the door um, if you don't wanna do it online prior. Um, and we're super thankful this year. We had so many new teacher chaperones willing to help us out. Mr. Hain actually stepped up this year, which is a um, big help for us because a lot of uh, the staff that usually, like Mrs. Um, Mrs. Moran helped us a lot last year, but obviously she went to go finish her degree. So it really helped when Mr. Hain like stepped up. I have, if you guys want, I have some of the permission slips if you have children that are interested in that. <laughs> kids at 24 and 26, yeah. they give me interest. <laughs> I'm just checking. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, and then on October 5th, we had our new teacher luncheon. So we welcomed all the new staff of Northern High School, which we had a, a large number this year, but it was super exciting to meet everyone. And we welcomed them with the North Red and Green and Gold theme lunch and um, got them to talk to some of our council members and kind of teach them what they're, like, they're going to expect for the upcoming school year. Uh, for my student work report, I have a, I'm currently taking the AP English course with Ms. Dabrio, and um, this is our first in-class assessed writing assignment, and it's basically a snapshot writing piece of, um, for like 45 minutes, instead of writing a complete essay, we really focused on breaking it down, so we just did an introductory paragraph, and then our first body paragraph, and kind of ended it um, there. So this is that, if, uh, and there's a rubric Thanks. attached to the back. Um, I know Mr. Bernard mentioned he needed me to talk about Hyannis. That would be, um, at, yes. We, okay. Lizzie's following up next item on the agenda okay. if you're ready with her student report. Um, I just wanted to say I attended STEM night. It was wonderful. Very, very well run. Very informative. Now, are we calling it STEM or STEAM? Well, it is, uh, I had it on my student, uh, my administrative report. Um, it, it actually was in recognition of Governor Baker's STEM week but we um, extended that a little bit to go with STEAM because we included the arts as well. But um, it's, I, <laughs> I think- I just wanted it, to make uh, sure. Yeah, no, no you're, you're right. Yeah. Either is, I think well, either is correct. Right. So. <laughs> Tomato, tomato. Or it could be STEM plus A. It could be, yes. Right? Yes, it could be. Or A STEM. A STEM. A STEM. <laughs> how, how well attended is that, by the way? I would estimate a couple of hundred. Would you say? Good. Yeah, we, we did a Dr. Main Downs Street did a sign up, but full. yeah, it. Uh, I think he got a last minute rush. I think he had it somewhere around 230 as a sign up, but you know, I think not everybody that signed up yeah. made it. But it, we, it, it exceeded our expectations, especially for the first for the first year. Mm. All right. Okay. Anyone has questions or comments? Okay. I think so. Well, I mean, actually, Mel, you posted the and the band one. Bronze also? They got a bronze uh, <coughs> get her medal for their yeah, performance. A total of four for the weekend. Yeah, they were performing at some MICA events this weekend. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, um, on to new business, the North Reading <coughs> High School trip student council. I'll hand it over to Elizabeth. Uh, okay. You would like to uh, talk about it? Sure, so uh, Hyannis is our like annual spring conference that we attend. I've been going since my freshman year, so this will be my third year. Um, usually North Reading has the opportunity to kind of appoint a delegate that we want to um, for the potential of gaining a state board position. So last year we had Duncan run and um, unfortunately he didn't make president but he still made our delegate for our region. So Northeastern Massachusetts region of student councils. He represented us on the state board and he served as a delegate this year. And um, Ms. Anderno alongside with our other council members are hoping as well as myself, I'm going to run for our state secretary in the spring. So we'll see how that goes. But it's always really fun just getting to campaign and coming up with the theme. It's just a really like interactive bonding experience for our council. It's kind of like to make a relation to the Red Sox. It's kind of like our World Series in a way because we work all year um, to really put together a document called the Book of Excellence. So every event that we do that pertains to all the different uh, areas of the high school, whether it's like school climate or 
ac athletics or uh, like involving the community, we break it down to different sections and, and then um, insert it in this book. And at Hyannis, we get the opportunity to submit this book to like advisor of the state. And basically they'll uh, recognize us as a silver, bronze, or gold council. So the past three years we've been a gold level council and we received like a plaque and it's a really big honor for us because we work all year to fulfill a certain amount of requirements for our events to really make sure we're exceeding like the expectations of our high school and not just like taking it passively but like really asserting everything that we learned at the conferences and everything we all the events we run are actually like benefiting our school and not just like a social event or some sort of like um, extracurricular so like it really applies everything that we've done so like we really work up the entire year to that moment Um, all right, so when was the dates again? I'm looking real it's quick. March 6th to the 8th. Okay. Well, how do you pick the 12 to 16 students? So we have our officers are guaranteed a spot, so there's five officers, mm -hmm. and then um, usually we get allowed another room because we have two members in the state board that are also officers, so we can get an additional room which brings four more students. Um, and we basically, we have a essay requirement and then we also take into consideration how much they've contributed to the council throughout the year. So if they stepped up and really chaired an event themselves or if they showed like they really came, they came early to help for Kids Night Out or they really brought in a lot of items to the bake sale and motivated their peers, um, we take that into consideration and really wanna pick the students that are the most involved and along with the essay requirement. Thanks. So the, the whole council can't go? No, we can only bring, it's usually around 20 to 24 students. Okay, yeah, I was thinking it was more than just like seven or eight. So. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll entertain a motion to um, say yes to the trip. I'm trying to find my approved. words. Yes, thank you, that's what it was. What was the wording? Okay, I, I, I will move to approve the North Reading High School Student Council Annual Conference Trip. Second. All right, having a first and a second, is there any other discussions or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Very good. Thank you. Enjoy. Yeah. Thanks. Right. <coughs> um, up next is Mr. Votto um, with the Adventure Club. I wish I could join one now. Yeah, just so you know, this trip has gotten approved in the past. This is not something new. Just for your information. Oh, don't worry, we can screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> this is the badge for being on the seat. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty good. You know, yeah. It'll catch you there. So, hi, we're the High School Adventure Club. My name is Stephen Bonzalitis. I'm here with Preslov Karpchansky and Matt Connor. We're all officers and juniors. And we're here with our teacher advisor, Michael Votto. So this will be a two night trip to Loon Mountain, New Hampshire, and it'll be on the date January 11th to the 13th. Uh, the trip includes uh, two nights at Indian Head Resort, um, motor coach transportation, skiing on Saturday and Sunday. Um, Ski 93 is the company that we use, so all tips and um, costs for them, taxes and gratuities, and a complimentary package for every 10 uh, full students paid. And this is the price that includes basically everything except uh, for lunch at the mountain. So other trips that we might have this year include the rock climbing at Boston Boston Rock Gym, which we did last year, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, hiking in Fellsway Reservation, the Wachusett February Thursday ski trip, which is always a lot of fun, and the whitewater rafting June day trip, which uh, we also have a lot of other things planned, so they should be fun. And then who's chaperoning? We have uh, two or three potential chaperones, including Mr. Votto, and then Mr. Andrew Falanga and Miss Madeline Lund. If you want any additional information, you can find the uh, contact information of Ski93 
at their phone numbers, their fax, and the actual website. You can also find uh, Mr. Votto at his, the, being the trip advisor, at his email and his cell phone number. Matt, I would just add, Madam Chairman, we've used this company in the past too, and I think you've been pleased, Michael, correct, with, yeah. with their performance, Ski 93. Uh, this is about like 20, 21 kids that are interested this year. How many students are in the um, club? I remember when we started this club, I think uh, Miss Brown was was, uh, yeah. was involved in starting it. How many how many students are participating? Yeah, so it, it, it varies every year. Um, so usually this trip kind of dictates how yeah. much. Um, but they, these guys did a great yeah. job. We had about 50 people at our wow. first meeting like packed into the classroom there. So That's great. It was great, yeah. <laughs> What do you do with the complimentary packages? Um, yeah, so I take one as long as we have 20 uh, students sign up, then the trip's a go. So there's 20 kids that are interested. Um, and then I'll ask somebody I feel comfortable with leading. All right. like so it's for the chaperones? Yeah, yeah, okay. all chaperones for sure, yeah. They're not in the committee, so it's not even within the budget of the trip. No. That, like, early on yep, in bed early on Sunday, back tucked in, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so no reason not to get up on Monday morning. No, no, definitely not. They should be. We'll be back on Sunday around like six or so. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make a motion to approve the North Reading High School Adventure Club annual ski trip. Second. All right. First from Mel, a second from Mr. Buckley. Um, if there's no other questions or comments. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Good job, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So PowerPoint on the next one. The next one, um, we have Mr. Votto staying here um, for the International Travel Club. Yeah, perfect. Um, I have the pleasure of also um, co-advising with my colleague Evan Nosey um, for the International Travel Club at North Reading High School and we're proposing the trip to Ecuador for April vacation of 2020. <coughs> um, this is would be the sixth year that Evan's ran it. I've jumped in about three years ago but I've been on all the trips but um, this be our sixth trip, uh, 16th country and uh, third continent, I guess fourth if you include the United States uh, trips that we have every day here in our normal routines. <laughs> um, we always aim for safe trips. That's our number one priority. Um, always educational, and then it's really hard not to have <coughs> just an awesome, fun time on all these with this itinerary. Um, I like this itinerary because it's super balanced. Um, we definitely have a place for history and culture um, and some nature and um, the train ride through the volcanoes seems really awesome. One of the highlights last year at the Beijing trip that we went on um, was probably the dinners that we spent with the Hutong families. So many students have just talked about how the, mm. their perspective in that was just eye-opening. And so I'm really happy that um, on day six we have uh, some time cooking and uh, farming with the community and there's a couple of opportunities for lunch and to have those conversations that I think really are awesome for the kids to have. Um, the insurance is all included um, in that price for the students. Luckily, uh, we haven't had to use the insurance, so that's always a wonderful thing. And there's just so many reasons to take these kids. I think the number of students that talk about it in their college essays and just, I was talking with Mr. Bernard the other day, I was covering a class and just, you know, three students, just, you know, the, light, the lights on their faces, the perspective that they gain um, is just, you know, speaks volumes for what this uh, opportunity is for them and for myself included, it's unbelievable. Um, so I can't, you know, I can't think of many more impactful week long things that these guys can do, especially on an April vacation. 
good news is you won't have what the 15 hour time difference or 13 hour time uh, difference that you right? had yeah, this last is like, year. I forget a couple like hours. One hour, right? yeah, yeah, it's like nothing because you're flying south, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's the cost of this trip? This is very comparable to all the other ones. They're about three thousand yeah. in that in that ballpark, um, depending on fundraising and that kind of stuff. And how many students? Uh, how many went to China? Um, Thirty-eight went to China. Yeah. So you expect around that same number, maybe more this year? Yeah, or? I think it's uh, this one is thirty-five. It's dependent on the buses. Yeah. Because um, each country has different right. size buses, so it's thirty-five students and then the five chaperones that would be able to go with that number. We mm -hmm. get one chaperone for every six uh, travelers. Okay. Yeah. Yes, my daughter went on the China trip. She's one of the, the eight, the scorpion and the snake <laughs> and the tarantula. Oh. Was, uh, she took pictures. She goes, you just couldn't the think about were, it. The, the pictures were bad enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we put fancy words on that, like broadening horizons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eating, eating scorpions, right. <laughs> It definitely I, brought the horizon. I'm just hoping that uh, Julian Assange is still held up in the uh, embassy that you'll be able to have lunch with him maybe when you get <laughs> I there. Saw that, that today, I saw that today. <laughs> He's there. Asked, that yeah, they're asking him to get out, yeah. clean up, or get out. Yeah, so take care actually, of his cat. Yeah, actually, take yeah, care of his cat. Clean up after his cat. Yeah, it's actually in London. So it is a matter of Just yes. a, a comment, if I could. I, I just I want to give Mr. Votto and Mr. Nosi, who's not who's not here, but um, does an awful lot of work behind the scenes in promoting the trip as well. Both, both Michael and Evan do a very nice job with these, these trips. I mean, as you can imagine, there's a significant amount of responsibility taken on uh, by them and the other adult chaperones, the other faculty chaperones that go. And I can honestly say, um, whether it was as the principal or as the superintendent, um, the lead up to the trip and, and coming back from the trip really is, is something special to see with the students. I mean, you, you, you've witnessed it for yourself, your daughter. But there is an energy and enthusiasm. They're dying to know what the trip proposal is. Tonight. Yeah, they that all That has are. been kept under yeah. tight wraps until tonight. <laughs> um, but I think it, it has been uh, eye-opening for me just to see what the reaction is when the students come back from the experience. And I, I never would have imagined that it would have the kind of educational impact and just kind of life-changing impact that these trips have had. So um, I'm, I'm happy to say that we've had very good success, and I think a large, in large part due to the the amount of organization and planning that goes into it by by Michael and Evan and the other folks that uh, have planned the trip. And, and if I'm not mistaken, we had a meeting not that long ago about the Eastern, Eastern Europe, Europe trip. Yeah. You know, just again, they're, they, they're doing the planning now for the trip that you approved last year for this coming April. So some six months ahead of time, they're, they're, they're gearing up, or having already met uh, with the parents at a mandatory meeting. So it's just an awful lot of work, and, and they do a nice job with it. And I wanted to acknowledge them for that. The Twitter feed is awesome too. I yeah, mean, it's yeah. a good so, way to keep it's up. So yeah, fun to follow that that's right. yeah, trip on Twitter. Follow you at NRHS Travel, right? That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. Evan's Evan loves it. That's his <laughs> part. Yeah. Now, how do you come to determine where, what country or city or place <laughs> yeah. that you guys? Yeah, we sit down. We go through EFs. Um, this was actually a trip that got just added um, this past year, and uh, we go through a lot of the itineraries and try and see which ones are balanced, which ones we think are going to have those just awesome itineraries and moments so each day is you know we've kind of got a sense of what the kids really like to do and what's the you know between a little bit of free time in the cities and you know so we sit down we go through that and we talk with mr bernard and uh mr lapret and we come to a decision that makes makes sense so always talking to students and trying to get their input as well but mm. yeah. uh john what what opportunities are there for uh, helping students who are, uh, have trouble paying for this trip that they want to go? She yeah, so it's, yeah. a, it's a good question. Um, I think there's two things, and, and Michael, please jump in, but I think they, they do do some fundraising. I think you have an event coming up at Fuddruckers in November, right? Yep. Kind of a, fun, a fundraising event. Um, part, of, part of why we come to you so early in the planning is there's a cost benefit to that, yeah. the early planning. that It yep. knocks a, a substantial amount of money off the... Um, off the cost per student of the trip. We've never run into a situation that I'm aware of where that has prohibited someone from going, but I think for other experiences we've had with things that we've propo proposed, we've always been able to, to look inward and, and, and make, you know, I'll, I'll use the term a scholarship happen yep. uh, for someone if that, that was a prohibition for them. But I don't know if we've encountered yep. that. We right just, now. yeah, we actually just announced to the three students who earned the scholarship. So, because we've been working with this company for a while, they have 
gold member status, you know, platinum, and so we get um, money back from EF, and that we just give that right back to the kids, and we give it to scholarships. We use it to buy um, like items for <coughs> the fundraiser, that because we have a little like raffle table set up while we're nice. doing the Fud Ruffers fundraiser. Um, so we do a couple of different things that that work. And do you do any outreach to sort of say all that to to kids who maybe are thinking there's no way I can do this yeah definitely um, so if the trips pr um, approved then when we have our meetings at the power at, during power blocks and after school um, we definitely let everybody know that that is available to them for sure okay yeah. and madam chairman I would just add a kind of a late entry in your packet I left to your tables tonight it wasn't off out of your packet that um, Michael and Evan pr had provided a brochure with a little more information too <coughs> seeing some of the things that they can do way back I mean look at there's it's literally on the right. cliff it's just yeah. stairs going down very <coughs> interesting it's beautiful oh the it really feature is. part personally I'm just so excited it mm. seems yeah like Ecuador would be great words like volcanoes yeah, and things look so. <laughs> yeah it looks awesome yeah, it does look <coughs> all right um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the international trip I'll move to approve the international trip to Ecuador any other questions or concerns? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you all very much for your time. And uh, awesome. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Thanks. You want me to do anything with this? Um, Ooh, I don't know. He's active. He's going skiing. Allison, you don't have a PowerPoint, right? Yeah. No, I think I'm, I'm exhausted. Thank you. What? Thanks very much. Oh, rock climbing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> wanted to go to China. Too. Awesome. Yeah. This looks good. Okay. Uh, so next on the agenda go. is. See you tomorrow. Right. Go, go, go. Um, Mrs. Kane, you want to just come sit where Elizabeth was? Sure. Okay. Do you want me to put it off? Or? No. I'm going to Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that sounds like fun. <laughs> oh. We go from Ecuador to Nantucket. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, hi, um, I'm here to talk about an opportunity we have to um, take students to Nantucket. Um, about a year ago, um, we did a mock um, shooting event at um, North Reading Fire Department. Um, where we played, um, not myself, students played um, injured, um, and they uh, did some EMT training with the state EMT training board. And we struck up a relationship with them back almost a year ago exactly, and um, they started to call us up and say, hey, best we've ever seen. We've never seen a program like this. Would you be willing to come on site? So we went down to Pembroke for a day and did some training with them. And um, since then, we've had almost a dozen um, trainings where we act, our students, act as um, um, victims in an unfortunate situation. It could be a car accident, but mass car accident, like a pileup, or it could be um, a shooting of some sort. Um, unfortunately, we're in a situation today that we have to have these discussions. So between classes with the state training board and um, and the, them training police and fire, we've struck up a really amazing relationship with them, and they've been inviting us to go all over the, um, the state of Massachusetts, and, and we are part of their team. And so we have one coming up here in November at the North Reading Firehouse again, um, and we enjoy our time with them. And then they asked us if they, we would be willing to travel further, and I said, well, sh I mean, sure, I normally take a school van down for a day. And they said, would you like to go to Nantucket? We'd like you to go on Thursday. And I said, I just, I, I can't do that back to back and it was too much so we'll have to pass. And then I got a phone call back from them um, a little, little over eight or 10 days ago <coughs> that said, we can't do this without you anymore. <laughs> so we are willing to not only move our time and date, but we are willing to pay an all expense paid trip for you and your kids to come to Nantucket to do these because it only makes our trainees stronger. Um, so I'm here to ask you, um, it's the uh, Veterans Day weekend, so we would go down on Sunday. Um, we would take a school van down with nine students. When I take students, they have to be 16 or older because it is quite a heavy situation that we get ourselves put into. They take classes and training with police and firemen in um, emergency situations, um, and then 
we, uh, we would debrief. We're doing it at Nantucket High School, so it'll be our first high school. We've done some colleges, we've done businesses, but we've never been in an actual high school setting before. So they are, because it's a holiday weekend, they are gutting, making sure no one's around, and so we're gonna set it up as if um, there was an assembly. And we will come in and we will be the students in that assembly. And so we will set that up on Sunday. Um, they're paying for our ferry across. Um, and by, by going the day before, we can take the fast ferry. I didn't know there's such things. <laughs> Never been in Nantucket myself, but we're gonna be gonna take the fast ferry over. We're staying um, at the Roberts house. Again, that's where they're putting up all the fire and policemen. And um, then on Monday morning, we will do the setup. We get ready, we get into costume with quite a lot of elaborate makeup and things, and then we run a full-on event, and the students that come through do not know what to expect. They are thrown for a loop, and that's what, and the students are our age. They're not students, they're adults. They're firemen and policemen getting their emergency medical training certification. Um, and then after the training, after the event happens, we go back into the classroom with them, and we do a big debriefing with them, and we talk about how they handled us what we saw, we, they videotape it, um, and it's a way that they can learn how to handle each situation because every situation is different and just to try to give them a readiness for anything. Um, and then we can take the fast ferry back um, to land and, and, and drive back home and we're home around 7, 7.30 Sunday night. I was very concerned when I saw nine students and only one backpack, so I realized it was one backpack <laughs> per student. I got concerned that that one backpack was gonna be awfully big. Yes. That was my only concern, but now- uh, We, we now can okay. magically pack costumes. It's amazing. <coughs> no, it's a quick, because it's a quick uh, in and out. Yeah. And they provide all the costumes and they provide all the makeup and everything that we do as well. I, when I first read this, I thought it was pretty amazing. But yeah, I, I, agree. I think it's- they take sure. us everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And their talent to be able to do something yeah, like that. Yeah, our kids are, they're quite spectacular, I have to say. Last year set pretty high bar, um, and obviously the new kids, the new officers and seniors and juniors who've taken over are also very spectacular, very mature. This is a heavy subject, and it's an unfortunate conversation yeah. to have to have, mm -hmm. but I'm really, really honored to have it with them. Do they do anything else besides sort of the acting out type? Do they have any other role? Just we we don't, well, I mean, the roles can vary, and um, it, it can vary from you, you've been shot and you are deceased, mm -hmm. right? So that, it, but it's a live body, and how do you handle that live body? Two, we have students um, uh, who play someone, say, with um, severe anxiety, and so they're not harmed, but they're hiding. Mm. How do you know that you can clear a room? Right, you think the room's clear, but it's amazing where, where kids can find. And I let them figure out where they wanna hide, if they wanna hide. And then it could be, um, it could be um, a gunshot if it's to a specific artery. We've learned all about the human anatomy, and I, uh, this was not my forte, like different vertebrae and things that happen and then how they have to handle that and how do they know what's happened to those students. It's pretty amazing. I'm sorry? Is each student yes, there's different roles based on each scenario that we do. So, I mean, we, like I said, we've done some, um, some massive accident situations. So, um, very similar to the mock car crash that we do here, but on a much larger scale. So, it could have been someone playing um, intoxicated and, and maybe have had, is harmed. Right, and how do we, and how do they handle that person? And then um, we've played someone who is um, carrying a child. How do you know? They have to ask the right questions because if you're going to help someone, right? If I'm pregnant, how do you know that? I look fine, but now you have to deal with two two individuals and and everything that goes along with it. So we get a different scenario each time. So that's the debriefing and classes. And then that's kind of my job is once we get that, I'm with those kids and then we prepare, we set up kind of a backstory and, um, and then we run our scenario and get it ready. And then they bring in the adults who have no idea we're gonna be there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always quite surprising because all, the, all of their training up until then is mannequins mm -hmm. and you know, guesses, you know, what would happen. Now what really does happen when you're dealing with a, a person who's truly scared, you know. 
So how did you come to do this again? A year ago, a year, yeah, a year. yeah, a year ago, um, we do a mock car crash every couple okay. years, two, three years, and a year ago, um, they were they hired the EMT training board to do a training at the North Reading Fire Department, mm -hmm. and they um, uh, called us up and said, we'd like some extra help. We know your kids really well. Are they comfortable with doing this? And I said, sure, absolutely. So we went down there, and we just did a, a mock one for them, but I guess the way I do mock and the way other people do mock, I, mine was bigger. Mine was a little bit more hands-on, and um, the kids had really great characterization and stayed in the moment. You know, ow, ow, my arm hurts versus my arm really hurts. You know, and how do you, not everybody screams when your arm hurts. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, or so so that's how we forged a relationship that one of the <coughs> owners, not the owners, one of the head teachers. Um, Charlie, he just took a liking to other kids and we just struck up a relationship and I don't know, it's just gone really well since then. Fascinating. It's really, really cool. Yeah. And what they've learned, I mean, the, the classes on all the science stuff, I can't, I, I don't understand any of it. It's fascinating to me, but they learn all about the anatomy with them. Maybe they'll go into it one day. I mean, I don't know. All right, and can you just verify the dates again? Yes, it's Sunday, um, we would leave. The 10th? The 11th, sorry, Sunday the 11th, and we would come back Monday the 12th. There's okay. no school on the 12th, okay. so no school missed. Okay. okay. We're leaving, um, there's um, Veterans Day. Veterans Day holiday observed. Right, yep. exactly, but um, <laughs> the morning, the we're, there's a uh, Veterans Day service here in town, and we have some students who perform with the uh, band in the morning, so we're leaving after that. Mm -hmm to get down there so that they can still partake in that. I mean, I, I, I personally, I think it's it's cool. I think it's <coughs> sad that we need things like this. Absolutely. But, um, my, my only question would be, because it is a, sub, a intense subject matter, and I imagine some students probably don't even know how intense it is until they're there. Yep. Do you get permission slips from their parents still? Oh yeah, it's a, I've talked to all their parents about all <coughs> of this, and then that's, uh, again, my job is to train and to prepare them for those things. Yep. Also, um, there comes the age situation, so I make sure that they're some of the older kids so we can have some serious conversations. Um, and then we do practice rounds here, and if they're not quite ready, they'll just wait till the next one. Like I said, we do about a dozen a year. So maybe a big, giant one isn't the first one they're gonna start off on. Mm. Um, and how, how has that impacted your, I mean, that's a, all of a sudden a big addition to your schedule in the last year. How has, how has that worked out? <laughs> Well, I've, I've learned that cloning myself, um, sometimes they're good clones and sometimes they're bad. No, I, um, I don't know. It's just, it seems the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. That's all I can say. That's great. It's really quite an amazing adventure with the kids each time. So that's how we're, it started. We're scheduled for a mock accident this year too, right? I think we're, yeah, we're, it's an on year. So. Yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> this is great. It's cool. Good for you. Good for you. Yep. All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the trip. I move to approve the Nantucket trip for the masters. Second. All right. Um, having a first and a second. Is there any other questions or concerns? No. Nope. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Congratulations. This Thank is you so much. Very great. Yeah. Very interesting. Very Thank you. Thanks, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Impressive. Aye. 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 Have Thank a good you, night. Allison. You too. <coughs> such a quick impression. Thank you, everyone. So as you may be aware, this is our MCAS accountability presentation. We have a new accountability system this year, so I spoke with the superintendent a bit about this. We're, we're going to give you, you know, enough information so that, you, that we feel that you need to know um, in order to, to be conversant. But it is a system that's uh, pretty, comp 
pretty complex and it is going to evolve and change over the next few years. Obviously now they've only got two years of MCAS data um, and, and with, the new, with the new assessment. And as that system evolves, there will be new weights and calculations to give more weight to the more recent years as it should. So th there will be some things changing. So we're not going to go too deep into the weeds, but there are some slides here to help us uh, understand a little bit about what's going on. And then I do end with some of the MCAS scores as well, just to talk about that. So the accountability system to begin with, um, I just wanted to point out that I'm a part of a, a network group with um, about 25 other districts. And we created slides that are being shared across those many districts. We want to send a similar message. And these were some of the pieces that we took from the state slides as well. I just thought it was important to share with you. Some of the biggest things is you really can't compare any of the accountability data now to anything historically because the, the percentages from one year to another, they're actually measuring different things completely. And so that's just very important here um, to understand. And there's also, there's no crosswalks between the old system of levels and the new system of categories. So it's important to see them as very distinct uh, accountability systems. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the non-high schools. That's one of the big changes is that it's elementary schools and middle schools are included now in one bucket. On the other side are the high schools. And you can see that there are weighting categories here with ELL and without ELL. And I'm just going to move to the high school because they're all the same as the non-high school, but there's a couple of additional ones. So this one, as I just go through them, you'll see that they're the same. It measures achievement and it measures student growth. So we are on the far right, the percentage breakdown, because we don't have enough English learner students to meet, meet in that category. So this was something that I, I thought was uh, very good that they recognized, that not to hold everyone accountable for the same uh, situation. Um, but it does indicate, too, that even some schools, when you compare it to school, to school or district to district, there's slightly different weighting even among those schools. Patrick, can you explain yep. exactly what, like, what is what does 40% mean? What, what does that? 40% of what? Yeah, apply to, yeah. Sure. So it's, this is about, this is about uh, percentage towards meeting your targets. It's a, it's a complicated, I'll show you there's a breakdown that might explain it a little bit better. But this is 47.5% um, percentage of the total points you could achieve in the calculated accountability system. So you have you have to get to that. Is that what it's saying? <coughs> this it's 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 Wait. based out of yeah. I I I think the other slide will explain okay. it a little bit better. But um, this is always been this is just showing the breakdown of the points. So it's a three to one ratio between achievement and growth. They wanted to measure both achievement and growth of students, mm -hmm. and they kept it at this this ratio. And you can see that they've a slightly different ratio here for. Um, achievement and growth. And for high school, they've included um, the, the high school proficiency and the dropout as part of that ratio to get to three to one. If you can see the here, language is just 10. this is a they clear three a to one. They don't have a separate um, percentage for English language, just 10 regardless. It's 10% for ELL, and then you can see what they've done is they've redistributed those points for the schools oh, without L's so that it's, okay, it keeps so. the same ratio and it's just a little bit heavier of a weight in certain so we categories. we don't have that then because we don't. We're in the right, the far right column, yeah. Right. It's like the quarterback rating system, Mel. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the additional components obviously for high school is the four-year cohort graduation rate, also extended engagement and annual dropout. So they're trying to measure not just graduation but also your dropout rate and also are you bringing kids back? So someone who may have dropped out who is on the fringe that you've brought back, they want to give some credit for that as well. And then finally, the additional indicators, they're going to look at chronic absenteeism, so students that are absent for more than uh, basically 19 days, so more than 10% of the school year, or the percentage of students completing advanced coursework. They want to see, it's not just the number of courses taken, it's the, it's the number of students out of your total number of students, how many of those students are engaged in advanced coursework. So those are things that they're going to measure as well as a part of the system. So I'll go to the high school one again. They're similar for these two. So for the, not, for the high school, this is what it's showing you. So you can earn 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 points for these different categories under achievement, ELA math and science, ELA and math growth, four year uh, for the different e extensions of graduation and engagement rates, absenteeism, advanced coursework. And you get a certain number of points possible, and then each is given a weight. And that's where this system uh, comes out there. 
The other key component of this system is that you're being counted for all of your students. You're getting 50% of your score for your all students, and then you're getting a 50% of your score for the lowest performing students. So those same students that are your lowest performing are, are being double counted. And the theory behind this is if we're really serious about closing achievement gaps in our state, then we need to really concentrate on those students who are at the bottom. And, and what they don't want to see is that you've closed an achievement gap because you know, the students at the top are doing not as well, right? And that's how you're getting closer. They want to make sure that you keep moving higher and higher and higher, but that we're doing as much as we can to work with our lowest performing students. So this is something that will come up again a little bit later. So, um, so you, you, get, you can't have all of the categories calculated for lowest performing, but there are certain uh, calculations that are able to be made. You then get a, a percentage there, and in this example, it comes out to 54.1. For the all students, it comes out to 70%. And those then are averaged together, and you come up with the 62%. So I think this might, it's, it's a bit of a complicated formula, but I, this is getting a little more, I think, what you're saying. So they, they're weighting those. You can see that the percentages there are the weights um, of each of those points. And so when you plug in all the weights and understand that the, the weighted total is 7 out of 10, and that comes out to the 70%. So on chronic, one of the things I was confused about when I was reading the results earlier yep. was that chronic absenteeism. So 4 would be the best score we could get on that, which means we have no or a tiny amount of oh, chronic absenteeism, yeah. whereas 0, would, I, I was thinking if you had 0, that would mean that's right. No, it's about targets. So right. it's all the scores are based on targets. Yeah. Um, and so these are the targets. So I think it's important to point out, too, that this system, when you see partially meeting targets, the top tier of partially meeting targets is improving against your um, previous score. So even if you had, let's say, one and you improved to two, but your target was three, you're still going to be in the partially meeting targets. But those three green areas, improved met target or exceeded target, that's where you want to be. You want to be getting in those areas. So places where we decline or have no change, that's where you're, you're losing points. So, But if you're getting, um, if you went from one chronically absent to, to two, that might be a decline. But if you went from two to one, that might be improvement. You get two points um, in that system. So what you were seeing on that other screen were the points from these categories, not the numbers or the percentage. So in the high school, is this only taking into account 10th graders? For for the MCAS, right? Only for MCAS, it's, well, so the way high school works, it takes into account for the left-hand side for the ELA achievement and, and the growth, that's for the, for, the, for the MCAS for the 10th grade. For the lowest performing, you're actually looking at last year's students versus this year's students. Okay. So it is taking into account the, 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 the juniors from last year. And there's, there's other pieces to the lowest performing. They have to have been in the school for a certain number of years. Um, and, and the like. So if someone moves in for one year, you're not getting their scores from two years ago. So it's really trying to be more fair about measuring students we've actually had an opportunity to have an impact on, um, but it's not actually the same students necessarily because you're being compared against you know last year's numbers, this year's numbers. One of the issues oh. I have with this is, for example, on the chronic absenteeism. So that's just including 10th graders, I assume, right? No, that would be the school. It's the yeah, same with the, group, with the graduation the rate. Yeah. 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 So, okay, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but a lot of this doesn't make sense to me, so. Wait, I, have, I, have, a, I have a question, too. So yep. then, so I was going to ask about the dashes, how some of them, <clears throat> some of them are not counted. Yep. But you're saying, at, at first you were saying you're basically double counting the lowest performing students, but you're actually not, because one is one year, one is a different year, or, or you're looking at the change of them? You're, <clears throat> you're double counting that group, so, so those students, once they're identified, are going to be counted as a part of the aggregate, and they're also going to be counted on their own for the categories where they're counted, so for, yeah. um, for achievement and growth. And so why don't you count some of the other categories? Because, because you're not just measuring whether those lowest achieving graduated in four years. You're, you're measuring whether all students graduated in four years. It's not, it's not counting those categories twice. No, I, I understand. I just don't know why they chose certain categories to count twice and others that they didn't. But just because of the the, the end size, because of the number, the, you know, they, they want to see the total impact of all students, and it's, there's not enough uh, students in those categories to calculate across the district, the state, and also it's looking at the four-year picture of the whole high school and not just those sophomores. So, 
Okay, and then the two categories where you're going to be um, for where most want to be is in the partially meeting targets or the meeting targets. That's based on your uh, percentile there. Anyone who they, they anticipate around 85% of the schools in those two categories. Another 15% might be in the focused or targeted support or needing comprehensive support. And then a very few number of schools are then recognized as schools of recognition, which we'll talk about here. There's also a normative component where you're calculated against other similar schools. So another change this year, as I mentioned, the middle schools now is not just compared against other middle schools, they're compared against all other schools serving students in grades uh, three to eight. So it's a very different uh, calculation. And so this is where our schools uh, lined up. The district also is not linked to the lowest performing school. The district is judged on a similar set of criteria. There's a few that are slightly different for a district. Um, but these are the, the calculations for how their percentage towards meeting their targets and then also their accountability percentile compared to other similar schools. So again, here, here's what I don't understand. If you go through North Reading High School scores yep. on ELA yep. and math and science, we were competitive with some of the best schools in the state. Yep. Yet I look up here and I see 42%. Yeah, it's, it's very strange. You know, when you go back to the points, math, for example, right? We were at 98% last year. So in order to have gotten the points to exceed the target or meet the target, they would have had to go to 99.7. So mm -hmm. we went to 94. You know, it's a few students. You drop. You're still in the. You're still getting that 94 percent, but they get zero points for mathematics. That's just how it works. So when you're when you're very high like that, it's it's very difficult. But I will say that that does allow you then to then make the progress the next year. So right. if we were to see a multiple year trend of these declines, that's something that that would be concerning. But right now, when you're going from 98 percent to 99.7 and not quite hitting that target. That's a different conversation. The, the issue I have with it is the message it sends to people who don't get to sit here yeah. for an hour or who don't spend right. a lot of time in school. And they say, wow, 42%. I don't want, I don't want to live in that town. Yeah. Look, at, look at how bad, look at how poor their high school is. It sends a bad message. And to me, it's a bad system. I, I don't like the system yeah. at all. I like the old system better. And, and I just think this is, uh, this is not... Yeah, it's a strange, it's a strange, that high school number is, is, is odd. And when we get to the other slides, you'll see exactly what, what Mr. Webster is referring to as far as our, our overall scores for the high school. At the state level, similar, this just shows you where things fell. 31% at meeting targets, 53% at partially meeting. 52 schools received the School of Recognition label for high achievement, high growth, or exceeding targets. Out of 1847 schools in the, you know, 1,847 schools in the state, um, you know, I, I, my friends were texting around, did anybody get any of these? And, you know, as, as I think we all know now, we not only had one, we had two, which is unbelievable. Um, LD Batchelder School recognized for high achievement for exceeding their targets. EF Little School recognized for high achievement. And just to also add in what we've done for science, Jay Turner Hood is number one in the state for grade five students scoring advanced on fifth grade science, tech, and engineering. And our partnership with No Adam, who is a, a, our program that we're doing at the elementary schools, you may remember, um, I think it was only Mel at the time that was probably here back in 2010-11, when we started working with elementary science, I stood up here with Kathy Willis, we talked a lot about the need to not only increase the, the, the funding to support these programs, you know, we wanted to make sure our science kits were fully funded, we wanted to make sure that our teachers had time, and to really budget that time, and to budget that that line item, which is now a standing line item in all the elementary school budgets. Um, but they were so excited. We're one of the first districts to, to work with them this year. And this is just a, a couple of just facts about science that you may have seen. But uh, the Hood School is number one in the state for its advanced scoring with 60% of all students at grade five tested. They're tied for number three for students scoring proficient or greater at 91%. The batch is tied for number two for students scoring advanced and 65% of all grade students tested number two in the state for proficient or greater. And only four schools in Mass had advanced or proficient combined over 90%, and two of the four were from North Reading. That's very impressive information. And so we did a, superintendent and I worked on a sort of a joint press release with the program, because they're, they're so proud of, of our achievement, and I'm so proud, and we're so proud of our, our teachers and our classes. Um, they really do a tremendous job. And I think the STEAM night that was mentioned a few um, minutes ago, 
was such a great showcase again for for some of the wonderful things that are happening at, at all of our schools um, in the district so just to get into the results a little bit I'll show you um, we often <coughs> talk about this if you recall from last year I did talk about how the test is more challenging there are more students now across the state at, uh, that are hitting the partially meeting expectations again you can't really compare that to the needs improvement scores from years ago this is a much more challenging test we don't like to compare ourselves to the state average uh, very often in North Reading. We're, we're always looking to do better than the state average. And I think that you'll see that um, for the most part here, we are uh, hitting those targets that we're hoping to. So I focused on our meeting and exceeding state expectations. And I just quickly kind of go through the, the grade levels. If there's questions, you can let me know. But 69% uh, for grade three ELA, 70%. Um, again, this is meeting or achieving um, um, so meeting or exceeding expectations and you can just see the graphs North Reading on the left and the state averages on the right 70% for grade 3 math 81% for English language arts in grade 4 69% for grade 4 math 82% for ELA for grade 5 66% for grade 5 math 52% for ELA at the middle school our middle school math is, is a really an area I'd like to highlight here too. 65%, if you just look at those state averages, 65% for grade six math, 63 for grade seven ELA, 63 for grade seven math, 63 for grade eight ELA, 74% for grade eight math, which is uh, very impressive, <coughs> I think. Quick question. Yes. Y axis, that's number of students? Uh, number of students, yeah. For the high school, this is what I was referring to earlier. Um, it's still, for one last year, they're still reporting this is the legacy MCAS score, so the scores look a little bit different. This is still going to use the terms advanced and proficient needs improvement and warning failing. But for proficient or higher, 99% of ELA proficient or higher. Mathematics still at 87% proficient or higher. And science, technology, engineering at 80, 89% proficient or higher. And as I mentioned earlier, very good scores here. Our grade eight, 53 percent, and I think it's important to point out, uh, if you look at the state average, just that is a very challenging test for a lot of folks in the state. 30, 35 percent across the state for proficient or higher. So that 53, I think, in in uh, comparison to the state, is interesting because it's very low at the state. And you can see what we did for our fifth grade across the district: 88 percent proficient or higher, when an average is only 47 percent. I think that's very uh, and our advanced number 61 percent at the district level and it's 18 percent across the state so I think our our science scores in grades five and eight are, are very um, impressive there as well so just for this year slight you know changes we keep having more testing on the computers and also more tests that are next generation MCAS so grades three to eight and ten for both ELA and math are on the computer and they are the next generation MCAS. The grade five and grade eight science, technology, engineering tests are both on the computer. Um, and at the high school, the science tests are still paper-based for this year, but we will be piloting and the teachers and students will get to see some of the style of questions for a computer-based test that we'll see in the future. But finally, just our, our next steps. We are that lowest performing student group Obviously, we, we know um, our students very well, and we know who, who would fall into that category, but we're going to use the data from MCAS also to look at who those lowest performing students are and calculate them. We will get a new group for this fall. I think this is a Scott's point. So we will be able to calculate who those students are this fall so we can work with them throughout the year and then those see how those same students do on the spring test, which will be a good measure for us to see how our, our interventions and supports have worked for those students. Um, we're going to obviously keep an eye to what those future targets and goals, there will be some new targets and goals that are set as the new system evolves. And we're going to continue to focus on our curriculum instruction and assessment, talk about, you know, as always, and we appreciate that, that the school committee constantly keeps the state test in perspective. This is, you know, a few days in the spring. It gives us important information. I think we all value it. It helps us, um, you know, it helps us to have an accountability system, but I think we recognize that it's only one measure of one part of our learning. I think all of these other things that we talk about 
um, here and what we've heard from tonight is the full picture of our students. So really focusing on what does that true understanding look like, our formative assessments that we're doing in class every day, our common assessments across grade levels, um, and summative assessments in addition to our state tests. What other assessments do we have as well? And a real focus on performance assessments. We think that's really, um, we did some great training the other day with a lot of our curriculum leaders around this topic. We feel that this is really where you know, the standards come alive in our classroom by measuring understanding through multi-modes of presentation. It's not just something you're doing on a few days in the spring sitting at, you know, at a computer. So this is really where our focus is, but we are using this data to help us with our overall understanding of our student progress. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, the interventions that you speak about to really address sort of um, the low end performers, um, at any point do you come to the school committee and present on some of those ideas and things that you're doing? I'm just curious on you know, how one would target that group and have interventions that maybe other children are not having and um, you know how that's balanced in a way where it doesn't feel like even more pressure than they already feel to be up to par with the standard so I was just curious do you ever you know present some of the ideas that you have towards helping those students at all sure I, I speak to it a little bit but it mostly comes out through the schools as John said through the school okay. improvement plans it's really Seriously? it's happening at the it's happening at the at the school level on a daily basis and I honestly when we look at these dates, there's, there's not a lot of, I'm sorry, when we look at this data, there's not a lot of surprises. These are the students we're already working with. We're seeing, you know, one of the things that we do, though, with the MCAS data is to see, does this align with other indicators from class, you know, from assessments in class, from other systems like the iReady system that we're using for math and ELA, um, which our teachers love. And that's, that's really something that I might present on and talk about that data or, or to share when, when we proposed that. We came in and talked about why we were doing it. Um, but those assessments are giving students and parents just great snapshots ongoing mm -hmm. of how they're doing. And those systems also have other ways for students to go in and show their progress and to build. So that, that's our whole point is to, you know, if we're going to have these systems for intervention, we want to have ways for students to make progress and to feel really good about that progress that they're making. And also for the teachers, too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, you know, I was just at a great uh, professional development with iReady the other day, and the teachers really felt that way. They do their what, what I need time and their blocks in the school day. So they break up and they figure out based on, you know, this, this most recent information we have. Some students need some things retaught. Other students might need enrichment. Other students might um, be working on something else. And they kind of rotate through, use our resources well. But then we have an opportunity for the students to take a progress monitoring assessment to see how they've done. And so that kind of information, you know, we can share here. We can also share through the school improvement uh, conversations as well. Thank you. Yep. Patrick, is it fair to say that the majority of school districts are partially meeting targets? Is that how the results came out? Yeah, there's there's uh, a, a good majority of those, yep. Uh, uh, districts, I'm sorry? Is that what you yeah, said? Districts. I didn't put the district slide in here, but yes, it's it's similar, yes. I, I put in the school slide here, too. And the other question I have is, is the big problem I have with this, and, and you alluded to it before, is, is numbers. So we scored only a three out of four on chronic absenteeism and a three out of four on dropouts. How many students, you know, yeah. is that like three or four kids dropping out gives us a three? It, again, it's based on a target. So yes, it, in, in a district with small numbers where we don't have a, we do not have a chronic dropout problem, right? Um, but a, one number can make a huge difference, right? Last because, year's number was two. Right. See, that, that, that makes absolutely zero sense to yeah. me. So, makes zero sense. So, uh, so what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of fluctuation over the years. For if you're a high achieving in one, any of these categories, yep. like the 42% the for the high school, if, if we're <laughs> at 98 and we didn't, we dropped down a little bit, that, that's going to be a low score. And next year we might go up another percentage or two, and that'll be a really good score. And then next year, but it's all, yep. that's, yeah, I can see how that's not terribly reflective of what's really happening. Yeah, they've built, they've built some of that in, and they're aware of that, and they are trying to do some waiting and waiting the most recent years more. But that's sort of my take at the moment is like if you do really poorly one year, your chances of going up are pretty high. And if you do really high, it's, Tough. They do built but, in a few safeguards. Even, I wouldn't even characterize it as really poorly, right? It's, it, you're, you're not as high as you were. Right. But yeah, I'm overstating it. Really yeah. poorly for us, I would say. Really yeah. poorly. Yeah, 94. Which, <laughs> yeah. which to, to, to be fair, is that's the point. Yeah. It, we're being graded against ourselves in that yep. sense. But, uh, 
it will result in a lot of fluctuation. We are, and the, and they, you know, the, there are some systems in place to keep those things. There are some things that we're also looking at too with the the reporting. You know, making sure that our reports are as accurate as they can be, and making sure that those districts we're being compared to are as accurate as they can be. Right. And so I've been in a lot of conversations, and so is the superintendent with the with the department about this, about making sure all that data that's reported about um, coursework and all those things are as accurate as it can possibly be. Um, yes. And to that point, because what Patrick is saying is we believe that there is room for improvement in the system and the right. ability, the, the gathering of the data. And just today, we received um, a survey asking school districts for their impressions of the new data and, and the way in which it was yep. received. And we plan to identify some places where we think that there have been some misses that yeah. um, are, are, are significant enough that they should be they should be looked at and included in the future. Yep. So, how do they? What's what determines chronic absenteeism at high school? Missing more than eighteen mm -hmm. days. Yeah. So, ten percent of the school year. Which is so you could have a student who rare. is it's very rare. You have a student who has some illness, and there so that's. So you get penalized. I, I, this, sure. is, this, is an, this is an issue I have with the system. It, yeah. it makes they, no sense to me. They, they have definitely accounted. If a student is medically excused or things like that, there's difference um, <coughs> in, in how those are counted. This would really be someone who's just not showing up. Unexcused. So there's un more, more of a truth. Yeah, like. and it, that whole conversation, though, about unexcused versus excused versus begs a question of how you're reporting things to the state. Right. You know, you're either here or you're not here. <laughs> But then there's nuances to that that the school might not even be aware of. So that's something as a district that we're making sure that, you know, PPS is, they may be more aware that a student is not here, but they're receiving medical support or tutorial services or things. Right. But that student should not be coded as being absent that day if they meet other criteria. So yep. those are the kind of conversations now that is critical to have because it's um, obviously Flex. the accountability all comes back. And so. that's nothing but a good thing. That you're right. having those conversations. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's, it is. It is true. It is good, and it is it's a lot you know, of work. It's, it's very good that they're right, and it's very good that they're acknowledging that those students are not absent; that they are right. receiving services that they need. So. Yeah, but 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 the point is, I mean, I think if if the number was two last year, the only way you improve if it's one or zero the next year. Right. right. On and the if drop, it's on one one year, it, that was on the dropout rate. Yes. Yeah, I mean, right, I, I mean right. the dropout. I mean, but with any of those, I mean, I just think. With, with any statistic, there's going to be some error amounts when you get there. When you're, when you're at, at 94 versus 95 percent or 97 versus 98 percent, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what the accountability really can be. It, it almost seems like accountability cannot be used for high-performing schools, period. Like, I agree value. with that 100 percent. The, and the focus of the system. <clears throat> You've been saying that. Yeah. yeah I, years. Saying that for and the, time, I think yeah. the, state, the state would say th this system is about – Focusing just like we're supposed to focus on our lowest 25, they're looking to focus on their lowest okay. performing. I mean, that's right. where they want the resources and support to go to, and they're really letting us mm. be autonomous, which, which is what I think we would, would want as well. We don't need the, the, the control from the government on, on, on the department on that piece because we are um, pretty, well, so pretty well in control. So. The other thing, I, I, a couple points I do want to point out, though. I mean, first and foremost, I think we all recognize that uh, Dr. Daly did not create the system. And so you can't really uh, defend the system. I'm not saying, you know, you have to, yeah, again, I, I'm sure you have some personal beliefs about it as well. And I think we all appreciate that you are doing the best with the system that we have to use. <laughs> I will just point out on the MCAS results, again, I mean, Massachusetts is a high performing state and to be so far above what that state average is, is worth noting at least. Um, I mean, and I think Again, whether or not the accountability results show it, I mean, the, the pure numbers from MCAS show that we're doing very well and, you know, we shouldn't, shouldn't lose sight of that. And my only request for the next time is I, I love numbers and I would love to have had more time to go through these as well. And so, you know, I w would have loved to have seen them before just to pull out things. But again, looking through them quick, it's, it, again, just with the graphs, just showing how much further above the state we are is, is commendable. Um, a couple of years back when they were doing the MCAS 2.0 or whatever it was, um, you, well, not you specifically, but um, you had a seat at the table of, of kind of like getting it going and all that. Do you still have that contact? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much involved with that. I've seen five or six presentations on accountability and we've been um, 
very much a voice. You know, I, I, I still see things in here, and, and John and I will talk about this, where I think that email that just came out was a reaction to something we said right. last week, or like, we'll, we'll, we'll hear that. I think our voice is, is very well heard. I, I lead a, uh, a group in the North Shore of about 20, 25 districts, and we've had these folks come out and present to us, and we really dug into, because when they, when they make their presentations at the state level, they're talking about a system. We've now had time to internalize it a couple of times, and we, we're now coming back with real questions about, well, what does it mean with this and, and all these different scenarios and situations? And so I really think that North Reading, uh, and, and I bring that back to our teachers, our administrative council, and, and even our uh, classroom teachers and others, and then bring that back to the state directly. So we gather that feedback and share it to keep shaping the system. And they, to their credit, they will say this, it's an imperfect system, it's an in development, it's in year one, it's like anything else, it's you know, in year one, you know, it's gonna get better in year two, year three, and we're giving that feedback. And, and I'm, I'm one, and, and John is one also, um, Michael as well, that we, we're always giving feedback to them. Whenever there's a survey to be had or, you know, to get on the phone with someone to tell them, you know, we're helping to shape that conversation and make it better. So if there's things that you think of to let me know to, to pass along, I'm happy to do that because um, we, we, we definitely do have a voice there. With the reporting, I mean, that's a big part that I've been championing because, like I said, it's not just our data, it's everybody else's data. If they're, if they're over-reporting something or under-reporting something, it affects everybody now. You know, that data, it's not just here, it's the way you're classifying, you know, you know, the number of technology teachers you have, the number of computers you bought, the number, all that stuff is being used to shape different reports. And the first thing you have to do is make sure that that data is apples to apples, right? So they're working on that, but we're also working on that as well across districts. So I have one specific, uh, yeah. more specific question than just a philosophical point. The um, only area where I saw where we just barely were above the state average was grade six um, ELA. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we'll, that co cohort will now be fall, right? So they'll go to grade seven. And I, I mean, is, so was there, when you see that grade six, do you sit down with the, I guess, similar to um, interventions at the, at the elementary school, do you sit down with the staff and say, why do we think this happened? And what exactly happens? There? Absolutely. So what we do, part of the approach we've done for the last few years, and it's worked well, John and I will go and meet with each school. And we usually meet with the principal and then with their curriculum leadership also, who's already had a chance to look at this data themselves. And we share what we see, we hear what they see, and they, they, we immediately talk about it. And we've, we've done a good job. The, the first thing that folks always want to do with data is jump right into the students. How did my students do right. you know, this? But we, we also do it at that other higher level first to say, okay, what could be happening across the board? What, what would be there? So um, one thing we're looking at is just as simple as you know, writing. We spent a lot of time last year. I worked with the entire district last year on ELA specifically. Um, students just have to know what's being assessed with the writing. You know, so they, they now have to type. They have to fill a box. They have to do some of those different pieces. And we looked at just that one assessment. We across the board realized that too many of our students were getting twos out of four because they were filling the box, which is not enough. Yeah. You know, they have to fill the box and keep going. Right. You know, so we started doing things like that. So similar conversations. We actually wow. will get the release of uh, the sixth grade items. Now they're in seventh grade. We're working with those students. So once you've had that conversation at that level, you then get into the, the student level. And so the teachers are looking at their own students, trying to f identify areas that are, um, that are weaknesses and strengths. And again, correlating that, are we seeing a trend? Are we seeing this in our other assessments are well or are they you know is this student writing really really well and then not so well on MCAS but if you see a pattern or a trend there you then start doing some different interventions so we've done some things at middle school we did some after school work last year that um, that that we thought was good we're trying to even look at the students who attended that and how many times they attended and how well they did so we're running some of those different patterns as well but again a multiple year trend of low achievement or something, but sometimes it can be a few students or a right. particular cohort or it was a bad day. I mean, it, can, it, it really can. We, we try not to get too, um, too excited about that, but if we see it over multiple years, that would be a concern, but um, we're not seeing that at this time. So another quick philosophical thing. I, yeah. I understand with the state and federal government, you know, they're, the, the grand goal of every, uh, raise, you know, the, uh, a rising tide to right. all boats, right? <laughs> But until you solve societal problems, and until you solve, you know, kids, homeless kids, and kids living with one parent who works 
18 hours a day. Right. That's never going to happen. And I think this system, the cookie cutter one size fits all system, both nationally and statewide, it just doesn't make sense to me. And right. it's never made sense. And I just wish, I don't have an answer, but I wish they'd figure out a better way. Because, you know, sadly, you're not, you're not going to rise. All the ships aren't going to rise at the right. same level. And so it almost seems like suburban, well-performing districts get penalized. But is that the right, really the right way to look at it? I mean, not, that, that may be true in terms of what we have to offer to our residents uh, in terms of the results here. But the system seems to be designed to make districts look at their underperforming students uh, in a way that might help maximize the ability of a district to, to, to you know, notwithstanding that you're right about societal changes to need to happen, but this kind of forces them to address those un not underperforming students in a way that well, they I, haven't in the past. I agree with that. I think it's just that, as Patrick said, it could be one or two students versus, you know, so I think it's- For us, yeah. Right, but I, I think, so I think in that sense it's good, but I think it's a um, it's an unrealistic, um, goal to think that you're going to change education and all of a sudden all these kids are going to go up like this when they don't have the supports at home and i, I just right. i guess i just so i understand sure. i understand the goal but i don't no, no question yeah. it's true i i think in in some of those chronically underperforming schools that are in those lower categories that are getting more dollars support assistance from the state when they see a change when they when they're able to say we've got all this poverty or all these English learners, and we went from here to here. I think those are some of the stories that you see, and that's what those schools are celebrating. Right. The good thing I will say about accountability, though, is you know we are we we have low poverty here, we have high achievement, but we still have some students in situations, right? And we do have some English learners, and we do have some special education, and it, you can't let that be not part of our focus, right? We still have a gap in North Reading. And we, we have to keep working at it. We know why. We look at those names. We say we understand why they're there, but it doesn't change our mission to raise those kids as well. And that's, you know, again, keeping the system in check, it provides a certain value to us, and we use that that value, and, and we move forward. So, I, mean, I think I think the bottom line is if, if, if the high end were just a range rather than a literal number, like there's, there's st statistically very little difference between 98 and 99%. Correct. Right. Whereas if it was just once you get to the top four, like three percent or less, or four percent or less, they shouldn't try to distinguish amongst four yeah. percent. Yeah, that's you know, and that's and it, that's the bottom line. I mean, if they can get to the point where like, if you're ninety-five percent are doing this or ninety-six percent are doing this, what if it's ninety-six percent one year, ninety-seven percent the next year, ninety-eight percent the next year, then ninety-seven percent? Statistically, it doesn't matter. They're all you're, you're you've met it every year at a certain so. threshold. Yeah. yeah, and I think they would say it's it's funny when we were at our meeting too. There was another high achieving district sitting at the table asking some questions, and the and the president from the state was like, you know, I usually don't get these questions right. about the 90s. Right. How do you go from 99 right. to 99.2? You know, it's usually so. Right. In some ways, we are kind of at that threshold. Yeah. When you hit that place, when you're getting the commendation schools that we have, I mean, we're kind of in that bucket. So. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, Mr. Bernard. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So there are two uh, two bits of information in your packet on NRPS 2021. One is my PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to use to have a discussion with you now, and the second is the updated plan itself, which is multi-page, but I thought it was important for you all to have um, a full copy of NRPS 2021. So I'm here tonight um, with the annual presentation to, um, to speak to you about the work that's gone on in the past year and to also uh, focus in on some goals that we have for the coming year. Um, I think it's important to just call your attention. The first couple of slides are just to reiterate both for the committee's uh, information as well as the public about what is our um, strategic plan centered on and it's it's obviously here it's it's this slide is to represent that it's it's focused on the instructional core it's the interactions between students and teachers that takes place in classrooms every day with content that's being taught being critically important I've included in this update as well and it's also in the first couple of pages of the full plan itself the vision and the mission of our school district 
I don't need to. I don't think I need to read this to you, but I just want to highlight for you that we still remain very focused on a, a, a pretty concise vision as well as an aggressive mission that seeks to um, to dedicate ourselves to excellent service and lifelong learning for all students. And again, just as recall, so the, there are seven strategic uh, objectives in the plan. Um, what we've done here is we've broken them out among three overarching strategy areas, being teaching and learning, technology integration, and student support services. This, um, this picture is to represent kind of the big rocks, if you will, that would fit into the jar. And the, the kind of the image or the, um, the metaphor is that these are kind of the large things, that they're, they're the things that all the other smaller things can fall in around. Uh, once they are placed in the jar. And I think we've been pretty good now as a district for this being technically eight years because we had NRPS 2016, you might remember, from five years ago, and now we're year three into our second five-year plan. So for, for eight years now, the district, district has been foc focused on these three major strategy areas of teaching and learning, technology integration, and student support services. Are you sure you need a bigger jar for that big rock? Yeah, the, yeah, the big, big rock, rock is just big. blows the whole thing out of the way. No, these are the big rocks. I know. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a stone. Oh, okay. A stone. <laughs> Not quite a boulder. Or a tablet, maybe. <laughs> it's the best I could do on the online pictures. You know? I was funneling Jerry. Jerry was sending yeah, me Yeah, you messages. were. That, that was a little Jerryism. It was. So again, teaching and learning, again, these, these objectives now have been in the plan. With these, these have not been altered. There are two in teaching and learning, two in technology integration, and then there are three in student support services. And I'm, I'm not going, again, I don't feel the need to read these to you. This slide, I just, I want to call to your attention the fact that there is a, a pretty strong connection, and actually something I'm quite proud of is that our, our strategic plan is, is not something that just sits on a shelf somewhere. It is a very live document, and we refer to it, refer to it quite frequently in a number of different um, meetings and in a number of different conversations uh, from the finance planning team to finance committee meetings to obviously school committee meetings, administrative council meetings, and meetings that um, educators have with those people that are evaluating them. So there is a pretty strong alignment to um, among the, the school committee's goals, the school improvement plan goals of each of our five schools, the budget goals that you all have adopted, and then the goals that the educators work on for their educator plans. It's nice when we talk about NRPS 2021 in whatever arena we happen to be in that um, for all intents and purposes, people know what we're talking about. It, 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 it now it has meaning, and I think that's, that's significant. I think it's very easy sometimes for a strategic plan to just be on a shelf and collect dust once it's written, but that's, that's clearly not been the case with, with NRPS 2021. And to that point, um, each year the Administrative Council comes together for, um, this year it happened to be three days of an administrative ret retreat where we focus in very much on our work uh, around the strategic plan and make updates that are kind of the highlight of tonight's presentation. So here we are at work um, this summer during uh, day one of our, our retreat. What you see, um, and I'm just going to call your attention to the, the larger plan itself, um, if you wouldn't mind, at the very back of it you'll see that in 2016 there were updates made in red type, in 2017 there were updates made in blue type, and then this, this past year, the past summer, the updates that we made are in the green type. So as you go through the plan itself, you will see updates made in each of those three years that correspond to the colors I just read. And you'll see um, a number of, of changes, um, things that either we didn't realize in the year for whatever the reasons might be. Sometimes they're, they're fiscal reasons, but not always. Sometimes it might be a slight change in our focus. Um, as well as you might see us delete things that we now feel are, are no longer necessary to be a focus area or it might be something that we, uh, that we did realize that maybe we didn't anticipate to realize as soon as we did. A good example of that might be some of the support staff that we realized um, for this school year when we, um, we kind of aggressively went at our budget um, in, in the springtime and, and it netted us some positions that we ultimately determined with, um, with the school committee to be critically important that we could not go another year without. So those are all reflected in the plan itself. And I would add to you, um, to this conversation that this plan gets disseminated across the school district once those, those changes have been incorporated. I sent that all out um, just about two weeks ago across the entire school district. So some of the changes that you'll see in the green type will be reflected on, uh, on this slide as well, that there is a pretty, a pretty strong desire to make sure that our curriculum remains aligned horizontally and vertically. Um, 
We continue to maintain, some of you that have been around a while know the curriculum leadership changes, um, or at least a, a discussion around potential, the need for changes potentially is, has been on the agenda for quite some time. The last um, collective bargaining agreement that was realized with the North Reading Education Association has, um, has netted us a subcommittee that's going to start work in November. It's already been um, formed with four representatives from uh, both the administration and from the Educators Association. So work will begin to, to kind of talk about what um, we might want to see for the district in the way of additional or re and or a revamped curriculum leadership model. Similarly, with educator evaluation, we're now in year four of the new system, but there have been some new educator um, evaluation model rubrics issued. There is a subcommittee that came out of the last um, collective bargaining agreement that's going to work um, on that with the educators as well. The state standardized um, assessments that, that Dr. Daly just so eloquently spoke to you about um, obviously will remain a focus as changes are kind of ever, ever present and year to year. And you might recall um, that about four years ago, we were able to institute um, data teams and data leaders at each of our five schools. We are now in year four um, of those folks, educators in our district, receiving a small stipend to, to lead data conversations at each of our five schools. In the area of technology integration, a number of new things that have gone on um, across the district with the Future Ready School, all, all in the area of technology, whether they be new programs, courses, or initiatives, the Future Ready um, Schools Initiative, the FIRST Robotics Program, the Massachusetts Personalized Learning Ed Tech, or, or we commonly refer to as MAPLE, Robotics Academy II is a new course that was introduced at our high school, the Large Capital Plan, again, I think this is year three now where we'll be seeking um, funds to advance our one-to-one -one initiative, and I just made a note here as well that we, um, we received $75,000 in state funds that you're all very well aware of to even further advance our one-to-one um, -one initiative. I think the order for the Chromebooks was placed last week, if I'm not mistaken, Michael, is that right? Correct. So we will be instituting those in grade nine at the high school in, um, in the second semester just after the, um, just in late January, just after the Martin Luther King holiday. Professional development in technology, because technology is so um, rapidly changing, it's important that we keep applicable professional development on the, uh, on the agenda. Um, the digital learning and technology plan, I, I think it's fair to say that those of us who saw it, um, Dr. Downs' presentation, I believe it was at the Hood School last year when you had your um, annual school committee at that school, that um, he presented the digital learning and technology plan as a pretty, pretty sizable and substantial document that will help to guide us for the next few years in our digital learning and technology. And um, the one-to-one -one initiative, again, as a standalone kind of highlighted focus area. Now we will have year th uh, three years of, of students with, um, with their district-issued Chromebooks um, at the end of the 18-19 school year, grades seven, eight, and nine. Student support services, when I talk to people about uh, my work, um, it's now 32 years in public education. Digital learning and student um, social emotional learning, student wellness are the two things that I point to as having a trajectory like this. The, the, it has been a, a, such a growth, um, not all, in, I don't mean it in a bad way, I just think the growth has been so rapid um, over such a short period of time that the work that we do in this district are to support our students to be the best learners that they can be and consequently the best people that they can be um, is significant. And I, I don't think it's, uh, it can be understated that to, um, to have, have achieved some of the support positions that we did, I called out here um, the elementary team chairperson, you know, that was something that we had been trying to get uh, for a number of years and to have that in place um, this year um, as well as an additional school psychologist at the high school and some support counseling at the elementary level was, was significant. Um, and we're looking to this new elementary team chairperson to, um, to really help us to, um, to, to identify where we might need to do some, some more work in, um, in, in district specialized programs and, and kind of look to the future, not only for um, kind of the economic gain that we might realize from that by having students educated in their home district, but I think more for um, just providing them for an in-district education for, for all of the right reasons. The social emotional task force, social emotional learning task force has been in place for about three years now, um, this being year three. I spoke to you all at, um, in my superintendent's report at the last school committee meeting about the social emotional learning retreat. That's something new this year. We have 29 of our educators, um, 15, um, excuse me, 14 administrators, no, 15 administrators, 
man, 15 teachers, 30, 30 folks um, coming up on a third day of work in November that um, is really, is really been nice to see. I think it's been nice to have 30 of us in this very room, actually, um, looking at social emotional learning in our schools and how um, I've been using the term the amba we're ambassadors now of social emotional learning. What are, we, what are we learning and what are we bringing back to our schools to help support students has been, has been a lot of fun and I think it's, um, it's going to pre prove to be very valuable. You may recall I spoke to you several months ago about um, the, um, the radar grant that we joined um, seven other communities, eight of the, uh, us being the eighth um, of, this, of the SEAM collaborative communities. I have to, I'm glad Patrick's still here to, to, to take a little um, pat on the back because he has worked very significantly as a leader in that group to, um, to strengthen inclusionary practices with the, um, with the hiring of a coach for which the district committed a, um, a portion of the salary we have 10 site-based mentors in our five schools um, working this year to, to strengthen our inclusionary practices in classrooms and also the um, universal design for learning initiatives. And also in school uh, student support services is school safety. That obviously remains very much at the forefront of, of my thinking, but um, I think it's fair to say that you know, all of our thinking is on making sure that our schools can be um, the safest and the most secure that they can be. <clears throat> and I, I have here, I think I've talked with you in the past about ALICE and COPSYNC and, and the Emergency Operations Plan, which was adopted by all of you um, last January that we received um, through Brad Jones's efforts um, with a seed planted by Mr. Webster um, to receive $175,000, which we have started to spend on um, some upgrades in all five of our schools, um, the most recent of which was um, an analysis that held last week on security cameras at the three elementary schools. This, this campus is, is pretty well suited with, um, with security cameras, but we think there's a place for, for doing some additional work at the three elementary schools, so we're looking to spend some, some money um, as one of our initiatives with that additional money that we received. And then just not really falling particularly or specifically within any of the overarching objectives. These are just a number of things that we continue to work on or some things that we're introducing. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of a discussion around the STEM, STEM week and our STEAM night. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that in my, in my administrative report. But, um, you know, it, these are just some things that have become very important to us as, a, as an administrative team. And I know that um, these uh, often fall within the, um, the goals that the school committee adopts. And I, I think it's fair to say that we appreciate the support that the committee gives um, to us when we bring ideas forward and talk to you about things we want to do. Um, I don't think there's really ever been a case where the administration has not felt, um, has not felt a strong support uh, from the school committee, um, no matter who's been sitting uh, on the school committee. And it has changed over the last few years, but um, that, that support is important and, and we appreciate that. And so you can just see a couple of more um, things on, on, on the second slide here of additional focus areas. I'll talk to you in a little bit about in my administrative report about the new app, but that certainly is something that um, you know we're, we're particularly pleased with. On opening day, I talked about a, a book study. This is something now the um, administrative council um, has done for three or four years. Um, we, we come together, we read and study a book, and we share out a presentation to the district-wide faculty. And um, again, I spoke about this on opening day in September. But the culture code. The Secrets of Highly Effective Successful Groups has, has been our, books, um, our book focus for this year. Um, Parent University, April 6th, 2019, please mark your calendar. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in my superintendent's report tonight. <coughs> so I think in summary, coming to you each year and presenting to you a bit of a, an overview of the work that um, takes place on an annual basis as it, re as it reflects our strategic plan is important and I think it keeps it on the, kind of the, in the conversation. Um, and so the overarching purpose for tonight is to just share with you um, where the administration is in, um, in, in working to implement what we set forth in a pretty aggressive five-year plan. I'm happy to say to you um, that there was a time when I would call the administrators together and we would kind of look at NRPS 2021 and we, while it might never have been said, there were times when it was, it was almost a little bit of an act in futility because we, we, were, we were really struggling to realize some of the things that we thought were, were significantly important. But that has gone away in the last, I would say, two years. And I, I think the, 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 the new positions that we were able to realize with the support of the school committee and ultimately the community with the, um, with the town meeting's vote of our budget um, has gone a long way to say, you know, when we think a little bit outside the box 
and we feel pretty strongly about something, then we can, we can convince others that it's the right thing to do for students. And I think that was a very good example of what happened last spring when we were able to net um, some positions to support students that um, we might not otherwise have been able to do without the folks that we were able to hire. So, so thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. I don't have any questions, but just want to say thank you. I mean, I know it, we, we say it sometimes, but I mean, you're just so organized and on top of things and you work so hard on these on these projects and the leadership is just you know very appreciated by the school committee as well so. well I appreciate you saying that very much but <coughs> there we have a very strong team yep. and it's and it's everybody um, I, <coughs> well I appreciate you saying that but there are there are some very good and talented people um, doing an awful lot of good and hard work um, but thank you for acknowledging that, and I, I, I will share that, too. And that is not me scuba diving. <laughs> I was no. just going to say On the say screen. That. I, <laughs> There's another presentation. Another? There is, oh, Mr. Connolly. Yes, I know. I know. Um, yes. I'll stay well, did you guys have yes. any questions for Mr. Bernard? Is it up there? I, I, is it on PowerPoint? I just wanted to state, I think of most of our uh, frustration has been um, Budget-wise, <laughs> in terms of not, not being able to implement um, yes. things on the plan, um, I think I'm I'm thankful that both NRPS 2016 and 2021 have been aggressive plans and have pushed us to push harder in the budget for things that we might know we're not going to get one year. But if we continue, right? And and you know, I, I think I started. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, with we needed another guidance counselor for the high school. I think that's about It right took about six or seven years, years yeah. to get that, yeah. and then we got, so I, I think that's that- That's a good example of- the, the plan helps us to focus on what we need, but to also be, be realistic, and it also gives um, you know, the town government side a good idea of where we're going, so they can, you know, you, you know this year, for example, one of the things we talked about was a, um, a, a facilities engineer at the yes. high school, middle school. We didn't get the money for it, but the town knows we need that, and there was some appreciation for it this year, even though we didn't weren't able to, you know, obtain the funds for that you're, position. You're right. So, so I think the plan is really good for us, and it helps us to educate others that we deal with in town, all the other boards, yeah. as to the direction mm -hmm. we're going. Well said. I would I would say also that. You know, the current state allows us to have that kind of long-term vision. Too. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not putting out fires and dealing right. with crises. I mean, we're, it really allows us to have that good long-term planning yep. and that long-term focus, and, and it's and it is bearing uh, results. It it helps us as well to that point. Both both of your points is it helps us when we get into. Um, not difficult conversation, challenging conversations as an administrative, as an administrative team. It, it helps us to remain focused on, well, wait a minute, we said, you know, in 2018, 19, this was a focus of our strategic plan. And, and while that doesn't, it doesn't often have to be used in that way, it, it occasionally does, and, I, and people respect it. You know, they, yep, okay, that was the focus this year. Um, so, you know, we, we, we use it and, it, and it has become a valuable tool to kind of stay focused and um, make strides. So thank you for the time to, to share with you. Anytime. All right, um, Mr. Connolly, Great. you would like to go over the enrollment projections? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as typical this time of year, we've, we've had the October 1 enrollment, official enrollment counts that have been processed and, and certified with the DESC. So we kind of look at and update our five and 10 year enrollment projections and it's important to do this every year because um, things do change. And uh, it, to me, it always is kind of the kickoff of the budget process in a sense because so much of enrollment drives staffing and, and what we're, we're trying to do as a district when we get to the the budget development conversations. So just as a reminder, I'll try to move things through relatively quickly. Um, the methodology that we, we do use is the pro progress, progression ratio, and typically what we're doing is we're looking at historical trends and essentially what's kind of happened in the past. Uh, we 
kind of assume will continue to happen in the future. And we calculate percentages from historical data to help determine reliable percent of increases or decreases between students that progress um, to the next grade or between any two grades. Um, we look at these trends over three years, five years, and 10 years, and we try to get a sense of what trend is most reliable to you know, students and ratios that are progressing from one year, from, from grade one to grade two, for example. Um, and we feel that these have been able to give relatively reliable you know, stats and allow us to kind of project uh, student enrollment. Um, we also look at what's going on within the market, uh, proposed or planned residential developments and our turnover of homes and a variety of factors with the economy and what's happening in North Reading um, can also impact the cohort numbers. So we do have conversations with the town. We do collect town census data, you know, birth data. We do look at the number of homes that have turned over and homes that have been sold, and as well as what um, is, in, is, is being developed within town, and that could impact these numbers. So we make our best effort to adjust the, the ratios we are using based on uh, all the information that is, that is known at the time. Um, so that's kind of the process that we go through annually. Um, we always look at kind of a, just a snapshot of enrollment history. This is almost over the last 70 or some odd years, and you're kind of seeing two almost bell-like curves um, with enrollment that grew very, very steadily you know, through peaking in, in, 19, in the 19, early 1970s at 3,461 students. It then dipped um, into the early 1990s as low as 1,926 students. It then began about a, you know, a 15 year cycle of, of increasing again, peaking about 10 years ago in 2008, where we're at 2,812 students. And then since then, the, the decrease has been relatively moderate. It's not has as much of a decline as you can see by the chart, but we have been um, relatively decreasing over the last 10, 10 years. I think that's amazing about that peak in, in the 70s yeah. was, the town was about 2,000 to 2,500 people smaller in yeah. terms of total population. Wow. So the percentage of mm. the population that was school age right. was really was high. High. And people are having a lot more kids than they are nowadays. People are having more kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's kind of swapped. We do have. You, you graduated with 900 kids now? I didn't, I didn't graduate from here. I'm kidding. 56. No. So that's kind of where we've been. It's a, we always kind of track that. It's, it's kind of interesting. And then we look at really the last 10 years um, to see what our enrollment has been. And as you can see by the previous chart, it's been relatively a moderate decline. Um, there was a slight increase in 2014 from the prior year, but for the most part, and, you know, enrollment projections have been on a sort of a moderate decline where we were at, again, a peak of 2,812 students. And over the last 10 or 11 years, we've, we've declined by about 415 students where we stand at 2,397 students today. Um, as it's been the case in the past, we really feel like this, the two factors that will have the greatest influence on enrollment will be the number of, of, of birth, um, the, the steady number of births to North Reading residents, which has been relatively consistent, and then trying to predict the level of kind of new in migration of families with school-aged children into North Reading, and looking at the, the, the turnover of homes and um, the economy, and the fact that you know the, the, the price of homes are reaching almost a 10-year high again, and, and to see what kind of impact that will have on, on the overall enrollment projections. Um, so that's kind of the process we're going through. If you look at the projections over the next 10 years, um, as you can see, district-wide enrollment um, is really essentially kind of stabilizing. We're at 2,397 now in, in the blue. Um, we're not going to see major changes, I think, over the next 10 years. That's what the, the projections are saying now. Some moderate increases and decreases amongst the cohort and amongst the levels across the district. Um, but for the most part, I think we can see enrollment relatively stabilizing at about <coughs> 2,400 students um, on average um, over the next 10 years. That's what the enrollment is saying. Um, and we'll see in a moment that that change is going to involve maybe a, a shift of some increase, a moderate increase at the elementary level of some higher uh, projected kindergarten class sizes, given higher birth rates 
from five or six years earlier start to make their way into the district. And then some of those larger class sizes start to, to graduate the high school and smaller class sizes start to make their way up through the higher grade level. So you're going to see sort of a change with some of the elementary class sizes ticking up somewhat and the, the high school class sizes you know, gradually, uh, uh, the high school gradually uh, decreasing. But district wide, we see it relatively stabilizing over the next five years and then maybe a moderate increase over the, the uh, uh, you know, about five years out from years five through 10. Uh, we look at projected enrollment in grade combinations. This is just information we chart. Um, again, enrollment projections are always most accurate in the earlier years, in the first you know, th three years, and less accurate beyond three years. That's why we do this process annually. Um, but uh, you know, essentially, grade enrollment from grades you know K through five um, over the next three years uh, you know are forecasted to. Um, increased by about 47 students from 1,049 to about 1,096. So that's that. There's that increase that I just spoke of coming uh, into grades, you know, kindergarten through five. Grades six through eight, you can see, is going to stay relatively the, almost the same next year, but then start to see an increase um, for a couple years and then kind of you know, you know, dip beyond three years. But for the most part, you see grades six through eight sort of leveling off around 540 students. And as I spoke of earlier, that the largest change in the near future over the next three to five years will be at the high school level, um, with high school uh, enrollment staying relatively the same next year. Not a lot, a lot of changes there, as the projections are showing. But beyond um, you know, two, years two and beyond is where we're going to start to see a, a decline in enrollment. And over the next three years, we see a potential decrease of 78 students at the high school level. What, what was the high school built for? What, what was the number of students? 740. 740. 740. 740. So now we're going to look at uh, just a quick snapshot at each, each level um, and provide the grade level detail in the, in the chart below the, the graph. Uh, but again, the elementary enrollment, um, the blue is where we, where we are currently, um, and the, the green is where we're projecting next year. So. Um, rel again, relatively stable before, before you, for next, year, next year's enrollment before you start seeing an increase. <clears throat> but the biggest changes we're predicting will be at the kindergarten level where we had, because we had a, such a low birth rate, kind of an outlier five or six years earlier for this year's kindergarten class, we're in the, in the mid-130s, and the birth rate for the incoming in the current class is into the, the low 160s. That's where we're projecting that change. and. The most accurate data that we've shown over the last five in ten years is that the, the incoming kindergarten enrollment, on average, has been about 16 percent larger than the birth rates, you know, five five years earlier. That's been pretty consistent. Though we have seen some outliers, like we did this past year, you know, somewhat. Um, so we'll see. A, we, we're going to see kind of that trend where kindergarten enrollment's going up, but then the smaller kindergarten class works its way into grade one, and you see the grade one enrollment going down. So. We'll have to kind of see where, you know, how this impacts, you know, staffing as we get into the, to the budget process. Um, but you'll, you'll, we'll start to see some larger kindergarten class sizes make its, make its way into the, to the district, you know, pushing the, the K through five enrollments up okay. over the next one, three to five one, years. One question. So I wasn't going to comment, but I can't help it. But if kindergarten was, you can only tell, like, birth rates for five years, why is it suddenly when, like, five or six years from now, you, it, projects to go up again when that's what we can't tell. We can tell the birth rates that happened this year for people that are going to enroll five years from now. Yep. But like why is it that in year six, seven, eight now we assume that it's going to be higher when it seems like it's going to be lower over the next five years? So we, we just we look at the data and we look at how accurate and how consistent it's what's been. The I mean I just don't know what the data would be for something that's six years out if the kids aren't born yet. I mean. Yeah, I mean, we, we just, because we have those trends, historical trends for so long, you know, again, that's why the most, the most recent, the most accurate enrollment projections, as I said earlier, is in, is in years one through five. It's, it's hard to, to, it gets less accurate beyond five years because you're doing a lot more assumptions and you're, and you're making those predictions and you're looking at um, a lot of trends. That's why we redo it. You know, it's important to redo it year after year. Um, so, but... We, we really spend more time looking at how accurate the data is in that years three through five, and we just, we're really making a, an educated assumption and guess years beyond five, because we don't, we don't have much data at that point in time. 
Um, but you know, over time, we have been generally about one percent within one percent, um, you know, accurate in in the most recent, you know, three to three three to five years. It obviously gets it gets more difficult when you go beyond five five years. Um, so then you look at the middle school enrollment. Um, again, we're, we're seeing this enrollment relatively stabilizing. I think it can be best be described next year. We're not seeing a lot of changes. Um, we do anticipate um, a little bit of an increase, you know, two or three years out before we start seeing a, a, a decline. But, um, you know, for the most part, we're seeing relatively stable enrollment at the middle school level. And then the high school level would be the largest change, not, not projecting a significant level of change next year. Um, but we are predicting, obviously, beyond years, beyond next year is when we're going to start to see the enrollment drop as those smaller class size at the middle school, um, in particular, I think the current seventh grade work its way on to, to the ninth grade level. Um, we have seen the percentage of the progression ratio of students moving on from North Reading Middle School in eighth grade to ninth grade increase over the last five years. I think it probably has a lot to do with uh, this, this building and this campus. Um, so that, that ratio has been um, about 90, on average, 93% over the last five years. So we're only lo losing about 7% of, of eighth graders that move on to ninth grade, where it had, was historically at um, you know, 87, 88% in the, in the five or 10 years prior uh, for a long time. So, um, so that's, so we are gonna see that the, you know, the, the biggest change is really gonna be at the high school level. Um, so in summary, you know, I think it's fair to say that the district enrollment is expected to experience a moderate decline. We're not going to see major changes over the next five years um, before we start to experience potentially another increase. Um, the greatest change I just spoke of will be the, the, the enrollment at the high school level, where we'll see it decrease below 700 for the first time since 2005. Middle school enrollment relatively stable, um, elementaries K through five, moderate increases over the next five years with a projection of larger kindergarten class sizes starting to work its way into the district. Um, and as I just said, and as I just spoke to with uh, Mr. Buckley, it's very likely these patents will not last as long as 10 years. Again, everything is more, more accurate when you do these projections within the, within the first five years. So it'll be very important we see what, what the economy does and what the real estate market does um, because they, we are showing signs that the real estate market is continuing to improve in, my, in migration of students with families with school-aged children uh, may start to return to North Reading, which will definitely impact these, these numbers um, in the later years of, of, the, of the projections. Um, there's already evidence of this being the case um, with a higher ratio of homes being, being sold in the, in, the, in the last three years in North Reading. Um, so um, we'll have to kind of see, see what happens. So that's, you know, in summary, that's kind of where we're at. And I think this is always a good first step of uh, the budget process, because we'll actually, you know, we'll start to use this data to see where it impacts, you know, staffing at each level as we, as we get into the budget development process. It's a question for John, and you may not have the answer. We may need AJ, but with approximately 60 fewer students at the high school this year, are we seeing, a lot fewer classes of 30 and up, 28 and up. Do you, do you have an answer to that? No, I, don't, I don't think I don't have a specific answer for you. I, I can give you a speculative answer. Yeah. My sense is the number sounds significant at first glance, but when you spread it out over four grades, eight classes, a minimum of eight classes per student, you know, it depends on where the, where the, where the, um, where the gap falls. I mean, if it's ninth grade English, you know, it's going to have an impact. But if not every student that the, the reduction is in ninth grade, which is the case here, because I think we talked at the last time about 11 families that moved out of right. town. You know, my sense is, you know, you, you're going, it's obviously going to have an impact, and I think it would be positive, but yeah. it, I don't think it would be anything that's going to be more than maybe two or three students in a class. So, but our, you know, if our numbers of 31, which there were a few classes at 31 last year, you know, got down to like 28 or so. But I don't think you'd see something more sizable than that. I'm just looking as we think about planning the budget going forward, yeah. that maybe high school staffing is something we don't have to think as much about. 
I think this we, year. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point, and we we actually had a preliminary conversation yeah. when we used a, an RPS 2021 about two weeks ago to start to think about what would be the the new positions we might be looking to talk about in the budget process. Um, I think there was there was room for discussion around the high school. Yeah. But I would just be quick to say that some of what we've been what we've been trying to get we've been trying to get for years. Right. And so we're probably at a student teacher ratio now or close to a student teacher ratio now where we had hoped to be a few years ago. So it might be playing out. But I, I think in summary I would say to you, I think that they're probably the focus that we've had at the high school in the past is less than it going forward will be less than it's been. Right. There just right. won't I, there won't be as much I, I I felt there's been a lot of pressure to add staff there when, yeah. we, when we ballooned up to 812 students. And, and remember, you, the school committee, and largely through you, pushed last spring right. to add staffing at the high school with that, what ultimately ended up being a 1.0, but it started yeah. as a 0.6 position. We were able to capture 1.0 was a significant help. It was, yeah. So, right. Thanks. But the schedule, it's, it's like when Jerry used to talk about district-wide student enrollment going down, when you spread it out over 13 grades, you know, it wasn't all in this right. particular, it's similar at the high school, yep. you know, it, it's not all in one grade necessarily, it's over four. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it's, I would say to you that it, 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 would, it, would, it would have some sort of a positive impact to what degree, I just can't say specifically. Right. Anyone else have questions for Mr. Tonight? Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Or Michael, for Thank that you. matter. Oh, okay. Mr. Buckley, I'm going to have you um, address the next school committee liaison. Okay. Well, I have, a, I have a short version and a longer version. Mr. Bernard suggested the short version to begin, at least. I like, so. the, I like the annotated. It's <laughs> a good idea. I, I think the general idea here, I mean, I, I, went to, I went to a couple CPAC events the last couple of years, and there was a very good meet and greet earlier this year with a lot of parents in attendance. And I know that there's a... There, there's a desire to change a little bit of the format of some of the meetings so that it's more interactive. And, you know, I was just, I talked to Steve and Vicki and asked if they thought there'd be a role for the school committee as a liaison and they loved the idea and wanted it. Um, and so I think my general idea is just that <clears throat> when you look at the law uh, that creates CPAC, that it envisions the school, the CPAC and the school committee working together to, su to uh, support students with disabilities. <coughs> The school committee creates policies. We oversee a budget, about 30% of which impacts uh, is, is directly for special education. We participate with the town to address uh, capital improvements, which you know sometimes could address accessibility issues, things like that. And you know, I, I mean, I don't question that CPAC and the school are already working really well together, but I want to make sure that the school committee is doing its part. And so I, I would volunteer to be the liaison as well if people wanted, but. I think that's the just the general idea of it. I just think you know it would be useful to have a liaison mm -hmm. that would just go and if there are general concerns or you know budgetary issues or policy issues, just to raise them to the group and and vice versa. If there's things that we're working on or policies that we're changing, you know we could report back to CPAC about them. So that's the short version. Yes. Did you end up having a discussion with Cynthia? I did. I did. I mean, some yeah, I mean, I think Cynthia's main concern was just making sure that it wouldn't be any sort of stepping on her toes or like looking at individual situations, which I, I told her that was never the intention. It would just be more broad discussions about you know things that impact you know budgetary or, or policy issues that we're dealing with and. Just to report back, because again, 30% of our budget goes to special education, and I think it'd be nice to hear what is being discussed and you know how things are going. So, and I believe she spoke with Mr. Bernard afterwards. I mean, I, at, at the end of the conversation, I think she wasn't. I think she seemed to me, at least, to say that she would support the extra, you know, person there. Just a, you know, any anything to support the students with disabilities. I think she's in favor of. So. Yes, she did. She did um, brief me after she. Uh, I think a reservation I had at the last time that this came up was that I wanted her to be able to weigh in mm -hmm. um, because she does have a pretty active role with the CPAC, and I wanted to make sure that she understood that um, you know her, the support for her actively being engaged with them still stood, and how did she feel about this? And so I encouraged Mr. Buckley to have that conversation. They did over the phone, I believe. Yep. Right. Yeah. 
And then she spoke with me after that, and I'm, I'm comfortable with where Cynthia is on it, um, <coughs> and also where Mr. Buckley has told me um, he is on it. So. Yeah. And, and, and actually, uh, Ms. Conan already reached out, and uh, she and uh, Steve and Vicki, the heads of the CPAC, and I are going to meet, I think, on Friday. Friday. I think it's Friday. Or just to sort of talk about the upcoming events this year and just to kind of have an idea of what's going on with them. And she, she invited us to her office for a meeting, and so yeah, we're going. That's what I think she was shooting for on Friday, Friday, right? So. Well, I know Steve. Madden is that uh, Steve that? McManus, McManus yeah. um, comes to the school committee and kind of gives us updates but he only does it like once or twice a year once, yeah. so um, when Scott and I ha were talking about it you know he was telling me some of the things that what happened in the meeting and just to hear that you know kind of observe and report back I thought was <coughs> really nice you know because I don't go to the meetings mm -hmm. and you know if he only comes once or twice a year mm -hmm. then we don't necessarily get caught up with everything that's going on. And they brought up some really good discussion points. Um, so I thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it just to I mean, highlight that, I mean, the two, the two ideas that came up in the meet and greet that I thought were interesting, one was a couple of parents with <coughs> kids with special needs, in particular people that had sensory, kids that had sensory issues, had mentioned that sometimes for the arts nights, they don't bring their students who get really upset because when they've brought their students before, they've gotten overwhelmed by the number of people and the loud noises. And so they suggested if you know the schools could open it up for students with sensory issues a half hour before. You know, and I know that I know that Vicky reached out to Mr. Bernard about that and she did. had a discussion already. And so just to make sure that got back. And then the second one was another a parent wanted to raise funds and you know take it on as as a project to try to light up the town center blue for autism awareness in March and wanted to do that and just wanted some assistance on you know how to do that and again I mean I just think there were good ideas that you know parents that wanted to get involved and you know again I, I think just like if I go to NORCAM meetings just sort of report on what's happening you know it, I wouldn't jump into and say yes or no on anything but you know just like when NORCAM had the idea of students coming and taking out you know cameras to take different events I connected and brought it to Mr. Bernard, and Mr. Bernard, you know, sort of took over and talked to them, and you know, helped put it into action. And I think it was a pretty, pretty good event. I mean, they were very happy that number of people that came. And again, I, ju I just feel like it's <coughs> feel like CPAC and the school are doing a lot. But when you look at the law, CPAC is an advisory council to the school committee, and you know, we we oversee it. We oversee the budgetary issues, and you know, I just want to make sure that we're we're fully doing the job to our the best of our ability and uh, frankly I just don't know if inviting Mr. McManus at the end of the year to report on what's already happened all year mm -hmm. it, it is really what the law envisioned. I, I guess uh, I'm generally favorable to the idea but I have two yep. um, questions or comments. One is the DESE is silent in terms of Correct. whether there should be a school committee <coughs> um, liaison. liaison. So I, I guess I, I don't know what where, where the state stands on that. And I guess the second question I have is, I, I personally don't feel comfortable if we're gonna have a liaison bringing back ideas for us to support, support and spend money for light up the common. I, I, to me, that's just not, that doesn't seem appropriate to me. Well, so I, I, I guess. Think, I think when I, when I spoke to Mrs. Conan, it was more, at least I, I took away that she, I, I took from her that she took away from the conversation with Mr. Buckley was that it was going to be reporting out what happened at the events. Correct. It was not. It was not decision making. It was just to give you, instead of getting an, an annual update from Mr. McManus as the president of the CPAC, you might get like four updates along the way through Mr. Buckley. Mm -hmm. Not not for any action items, but more just this is what the, for example. I would expect that at the next meeting you might talk about the event that they're having this coming Thursday night. Correct. The financial seminar, and just to, just to inform the committee about that. Okay, so I don't I don't want to I don't think we should be making. I I, I would agree with you. School committee. Yeah, I think and I think you had a conversation with Cynthia about that. that like right. not commitments, you know. Right. It would just okay. be informing. But I think, much like, <clears throat> you, we do as an athletic, you do as an athletic yeah. subcommittee or a NORCAM rep or what it can, you know when it was uh, SSBC. You would just report on what took place at the meeting, but I think you know Cynthia did have hesitation, as do I. That, and I'm hearing from you that you know we don't want to be committing to anything because I think there is some 
Well, for, there are some wait, tentacles to yeah. that that we might not be able to honor, and I just want to be right, careful yeah. that we don't get ourselves into a pinch. Well, what is the state? So <laughs> are there districts that have liaisons? And there are and there aren't. I, d you know, I, I know of some districts that do, and I know of some districts that don't okay. yeah. in and our area. I think, it's, I think it's really a, just a wish of the, um, you know, of a committee and, and where you want to be on it. Um, okay. I don't think, you know, I think it was important for me to know that this was not in any way a reflection on Cynthia and what she was doing with the CPAC. I think everybody agreed with that, but I wanted, I wanted her to know that very clearly from me, mm -hmm. that it was not anything that was not being felt from the committee that you were, you know, absent information. I mean, you know, I think, and I think, you know, we, we hear every year that, and you've heard it, I think, too, Mr. Buckley, that the CPAC is happy with the relationship they have with the administration. So. Yeah, and uh, well, just to address Mr. Webster <coughs> for a second, too, I mean, on the, on the light up the town, I mean, it was a woman that said, I want to get the funds, I want to get donations. I think it's just good to know and, you know, be just to want to know what's going on. And then, as for the legal, I mean, when you look at the law, you know, Section 3, I put, I put out a little uh, section. It says that the goal is to establish a parent advisory council in special education. And at one point it says the parent advisory council duties shall include advising the school committee on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students and disabilities and evaluation of the school committee's special education programs. I just, I just think it's important to make sure that they have the ability to do that. And I don't think one time a year coming here and reporting, it, again, I mean, I'm not saying it's not legally sufficient, but... I think it could be done better. And you know, another section talks about, you know, the parent advisory council shall receive assistance from the school committee without charge. And so I just think going, reporting on what's happening, um, I, I don't see a negative of it. So I, Again, so, I don't have yeah. a problem with it, but I, I just yeah. look at it's a parent advisory council. I mean, should we have a um, school committee liaison to the PTOs? No, but P PTOs are not legally mandated. The CPAC is. Other school committees have liaisons to the PTOs. I'm just, I'm just so, saying I'm so, there are other groups. Yeah. That's all. Scott, uh, I just want to drill down one, one thing, just comparing the lighting up in blue example to your example on the cameras in NORCAM. Yep. So would you envision something like the lighting up in blue question coming up and, and bringing, that, bringing that to Mr. Bernard as saying, hey, is, is, there, is this something you could or, – or would you – refrain from doing that because your role there is simply to report back to us? Well, I, I wouldn't bring up anything in the meeting. I would just, if they asked a specific request of the school for something, like if they wanted to send out a notice about it, or if they wanted to try to get the town and the school to do some sort of awareness, like proclamation or something. That's where I wonder where the, where the overlap between what you're doing and what Cynthia's doing. Right. Yeah, right, I, right, right now, those kinds of things, like what you just said, come very directly to me right yeah. with I mean I'm I'm promoting their event Thursday night okay. and I have for years and so that that's getting done yeah. you know the, 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 the line of communication between the CPAC and Cynthia and me often Steve it's usually Steve McManus that's the conduit and he usually writes to both Cynthia and me and because I have the blackboard connectability for the district I just do it um, and that's entirely and appropriate yeah. and I would find I would think it would be more that Mr. Buckley might come to a meeting here and say to you, in March, the CPAC is planning to do this event. Yep. You know, and that just to let you know that it's going to be happening, much like, you know, Mrs. Imbriano said that you learned some things that you yep. weren't, you, you might learn about them after they've happened right. as opposed to them coming up. Right. Or in some cases, depending on your meeting schedule, you might be learning about it a little bit after, but it would be not the, whatever it is, the traditional meet May meeting. But I think if it's, if it's just a, a reporting of what the CPAC is doing, I think that's a very safe place for the committee to be, yep. which consequently means that's a safe place where the district is. Mm -hmm. So that, I would just make that distinction as opposed yeah. to the, the NORCAM board or, or something like that where we don't already have uh, someone from the district attending those meetings uh, with purpose. See, I think a good follow-up to that would be if you are at the meeting, Mr. Buckley, you say, my understanding is you work through Mr. Bernard, I would just refer you to him. Yeah. So that it's one that line that communication piece stays intact. All right. Um, so, do you want to make a motion to make a sub? Sure. I mean, committee? should I tell you two motions to create the position and then to nominate? Nominate one for it or not? I would. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I move to appoint a liaison to the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Second. Okay. 
any more fa uh, questions or concerns? Do, uh, I, just one thing. In any of these other positions that we have in the in the committee, do they are are any of the is the position outlined in any way, or is it just named like this one, like this would be? So I think they're just named. Just yeah. the yeah. just okay. the only ones that aren't are the officers. Right, where they right. have specific duties. right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Is it a motion? Yeah, because we like we always have a motion to yeah. appoint people to the other okay. committee. So yeah, you have to have a motion. Okay. Yes. So I move to nominate Scott Buckley as our representative for the subcommittee. Second. Okay. Perfect. All in favor? Could Aye. I just, talk, just a question? Would that be for one year? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you want to do in the same? Cycle yeah, I would think. You do? Okay. Yes, yeah. for the remainder of. I would say in, it, it expires yeah. in, May. in May. In May. Yeah. yeah. When you do the reorganization. Okay. okay. Yeah. Or be a liaison. A liaison, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Point of liaison. Thank you. All right. Uh, routine matters. We have some minutes. I'll take a motion to accept the minutes open session of September 10th. Move to approve uh, open session September 10 minutes. I'll second. Uh, any questions or concerns on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, motion carries. I'll entertain a motion to accept the open session of September 24th. Move to accept um, open session minutes for September 24th, 2018. I'll second. Any questions or concerns on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes carry. Motion carry, sorry. Um, open session town meeting. Uh, Excuse me, I'll accept a motion to accept the open session town meeting minutes of October 15th. I will move to uh, accept the minutes for the op uh, October 15th open session town meeting. Second. Okay. Any questions or concerns on the minutes? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. One abstention. See, I knew you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to make that <laughs> yeah. motion, so yeah. I, I was ready. Very good, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next we have. The budget update, Mr. Conley. Great, thank you. So this evening uh, in your packet was the October budget report, which essentially summarizes financial activity through the middle of October. Um, again, it's broken down into two pages, expense activity and payroll activity. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, similar to what we spoke of at the last meeting, that we are in solid financial standing, but given a variety of factors, um, you know, things are certainly uh, remain very, very tight. Um, as we discussed during the budget development process, you know, items like teacher salaries, special education, altruistic tuition expenses, and building and grounds maintenance contractual service line items, um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, flexibility and, and they were all budgeted very, very tight. So I think it's important that we continue to monitor these expenses uh, closely as we move through the fiscal year. Um, I referenced at the last uh, budget update, and that remains the case now, that the amount that we exceeded our special education prepayments is projected that we will need to use the amount that we um, exceeded the, the FY18 budget forecast at the end of, of fiscal 18. Um, and what that means is that there's just a lot less of, you know, flexibility and, 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 and ability to, to address unforeseen costs. Um, you know, all supplies necessary to start, to start the school year ha have been ordered and, and processed. Um, but I think as referenced in the report in the, what's the third paragraph, um, myself and Superintendent Bernard and the district administration felt <coughs> it was a necessary uh, action to implement sort of a non-essential uh, you know, budget freeze, which began this past month. Um, that's not uncommon, although it may be uncommon that it's occurring you know, just past the first quarter of the fiscal year. 
Um, what that really means is that district administration and, and building principals and budget leaders um, would just have to have kind of a conversation with myself and Superintendent Bernard you know, before any kind of non-essential or emergency item is, is, is ordered or, or, or processed. Um, we feel that's just an appropriate action to take at this, at this point in the year. Um, we've talked about the food service program on a regular basis. Uh, they closed out the month of September with a little more than a $12,000 net loss. Uh, this was slightly higher than we forecasted, but it is not unusual that the program typically experiences a loss in September with the higher food and labor and production costs and to get the program you know, start up, start, started up on the right track. Um, that being said, there was some positive signs. You know, male counts at the middle school on, on average were up 5%. Um, and male, male counts at the Bachelor Elementary School were actually up 20% uh, when compared to last year. We are starting to see breakfast sales at the high school in the new breakfast program at the Bachelor Elementary School, um, which is geared towards the before school program there. Starting, it, made, it started slow the first couple weeks of the school year, but there was, there was evidence at the end of the month that those were showing signs of increasing as we began to enter the second month of the school year this past October. Uh, so these are just all important trends that we'll monitor as we normally do, given that there is, again, no general fund subsidy this year um, in the budget. On the payroll side, um, the district once again experienced a very busy summer, filling a variety of staff vacancies. Um, and as you may recall, the budget process in FY19, we did budget a higher teacher attrition estimated savings and turnover amount than we had in the past. Um, I think it's fair to say we met that savings amount and even exceeded it somewhat, which is which was is good news. Um, we're once again seeing a need to hire long-term substitutes to fill a variety of, of, of leave of absences and number of positions this school year. So we'll just, as we always do, we'll, we'll just stay on top of that and, and monitor that impact on the substitute budget. But I'm not seeing any any issue at this point in time. Um, the one thing that we, uh, we did want to bring to your attention through this budget report is that we did need to hire an additional special education paraprofessional or, or, or move to hire to meet the needs of a new student in the preschool program that moved into to the district that does require one-to-one -one support. Um, we do feel uh, that the funding is available due to savings achieved through attrition and turnover of staff in paraprofessional line items, so we had a variety of, of turnover or positions that went unfilled. Um, we had some, some late resignations um, in August and September, so we, we do feel like we can come up with the funding to, um, to fund this position, but it is a required position that we had to move forward with. Um, other than that, more, you know, most payroll projections <coughs> this time indicate that they are very close to the budgeted line items, and again, as we enter the second quarter of the fiscal year, I think we're in you know, solid financial standing. There's no cause for any you know, alarm, although I think that the trend is that things are tight, <coughs> not, a lot, not a lot of buffer, not a lot of flexibility um, as, as we move through the fiscal year. That being said, I'll entertain any questions. I, mean, I have two. One is on the um, non-essential, the freeze of non-essential um, items. Can you give me an example of something that, is it something that would be, have been in the budget but is not essential or is it something that's coming up? Or, uh, I guess I'm not sure what you yeah. mean. Yeah, so every, everything that the, the, the schools mainly would, would need or had budgeted, startup supplies, yep. textbooks, materials, classroom materials, um, that to start the school year, to get the, the classrooms <coughs> has, has right. been funded, has been processed, yep. they're encumbered, they're ordered, they've, They've kind of pre-encumbered some of some of their go-to supplies. So as as they need a, an item in the classroom or general supply, they can go and order that because they've they've have an, have an open PO that yep. matches their budget. What this is is really kind of the, kind of the extra item that might be an extra professional development opportunity right. that that arises for a staff to maybe go attend a workshop or incur yep. some travel expenses that. Yep. We would just have that conversation and assess the the need and the priority of that of that cost. Okay, that makes sense. And my second question was on the, um, funding the new special education paraprofessional para uh, through attrition and turnover. So does that mean that the paraprofessionals that are, where there's been attrition are, are, are not 
Are they from the special education professionals or are they just generally? They, this is from the special education general. Yeah, department. so that's a se separate line item. So uh, it would be the same same line item. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had we've had turnover. Most of our paraprofessionals are classified as special education paraprofessionals. Okay. So the vast majority and makes sense. Yeah. Forty five of the sixty two FTE are, are considered special education paraprofessionals. So within that line item, uh, we feel that we'll have the funding to support this additional okay. cost and the prorated salary. Um, because we, we did have a number of positions that just went vacant for a period of time due to some late you know, turnover. Right, I see. Okay. Right. Mr. Buckley. I mean, uh, I, I don't want to disagree with Mr. Connolly, but I would just say that I, from the report, I mean, I disagree a bit with the statement that we're in solid financial standing. Um, I mean, a budget freeze this early is concerning and something that. I mean, I just, I just hate not having flexibility. Um, you know, the increase of special education costs, the one-on-one, -on -one, long-term substitutes, it just, I mean, it, it's just concerning. I mean, I know that when we build the budget, we have to make cuts at times, but, you know, a budget freeze after the first quarter of a year is, is hard. And We've done it's this, pretty I think, it's pretty yeah, a number of years in a row. I know. It's just, it's... I think what yeah. Michael means when he says Sorry. solid financial standing is we're not, we're not running in the red. We're not right. running. Right. 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 Correct. But again, it, it, it's just like we're, we have very little flexibility if yeah. other things occur. And, and I think there's, um, so that, yeah, it's exactly what, what I'm yeah. referring to by, by that statement. Yep. I think, you know, when it's not, we're able to address the items that are, that are needed. I just, if that unforeseen, um, if co continuing of unforeseen right. either in the, the maintenance yep. department or the special education department, it's going to, you know, pose a challenge. Um, we're going to have a significant winter. I think in a lot of yeah. ways, I think we've, talked about all these same things when we passed the FY19 budget did. development yeah. process. I mean, I can remember presenting a slide that Absolutely. says areas of risk mm -hmm. and concern, and this was one of them, yep. that there's been less and less flexibility. We're just, we're not building in a level of budget uh, buffer, a level of contingency. We don't budget contingencies. Um, right. And this is, this is the, yep. the case. We have to just be very frugal with the decisions we're making. Well, I go beyond what Scott says, though. When we're, we're never in good financial shape when you're supplementing your budget with fees, which we right. never should have. Right. Right. No public school should have ever done that in the first place. And you're not in good financial shape when you have two, what I consider minor projects you'd like to do at the softball field, and you don't have the twenty-five to $30,000 to do those projects, which would be to put up a scoreboard and enclose the bench areas so the softball players have dugouts. Yeah. We don't have that money. We don't even have it in the revolving account, in the right. athletic revolving account which is running at almost a, a break even. Almost a break even. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, Scott's right. In one sense, yeah, okay, we're, we're in solid financial shape, but in another sense, we're not. I, uh, that being said, I think I, I, I think I do understand that, you know, the budget is progressing as kind yeah. of expected. Right. Yes. And then I'll, and I'm clearly you, you, you guys are, have it all, you know, are, are, very much aware and, and uh, of what's going on and, and have taken steps already to to uh, to yeah. address that as, as, as much as possible our budget is very much kind of the you know what's needed and the kind of the necessities there's not yeah. a lot of the we, we, we tend to be pretty conservative I think yeah. both Michael um, and I too and you know it's that's I think it's a good thing yep. um, but it does put us in a position where where <coughs> where you know more day to day than we might like to be, particularly this early in the year. Yeah, you know, I think yeah. the winter is it concerns me. Yeah. I think it, I don't. It concerns Michael too, but it really, you know, I, I, that's such a, a variable. Yeah. Um, you know, an expense like we did with the hiring of a staff person. You know, that's a very that could happen again. You know, yep. in another month, we just don't know. The scariest thing to me is is we rely so much on outside funds that are out of our control. On the mm -hmm. generosity of, um, you know, booster groups oh, or parent groups, or and also on yeah. fees, mm -hmm. and that's you know, that's out of record. We've come to expect that, right. really, and in, in, you know, it's right. right. And if it ever stopped to, right. to a certain extent, right. there'd be things right. we wouldn't be able to do. Exactly. Yeah. And, on, and on the one other question on, on the food service uh, program, you said that you it was a larger loss than expected. I mean, what was the budgeted expected loss? Do you know? So we budgeted around seven thousand dollars. So it was about five thousand dollars more. more. Although I, I will say, what I I was extremely concerned by that delta because we've been there before, and it's it's kind of we almost um, 
you know, we've, we've lost more than we maybe anticipated in the month of September. And, um, and then we do better as we go forward. It's kind of what we have come to expect. So it's sort of, um, you know, I think we have certainly had the time to make it up. And we, the, the, the thing that I think is positive is that some of the, the middle school lunch counts continue to increase, you know, with year three or four into this building. Um, and we're still seeing more students as they come into the middle school starting to buy lunch. And uh, we were 20 to 25% higher all last year. And even looking at that data last year, we're five, six, 7% higher on a daily basis this year um, on top of that. And the high school continues to do well. And the bachelor elementary school had, had, had huge numbers in the month of September. So when those things are up, and then if you're, you know, if you can control the, the cost and over time, we'll be able to do that after the first you know, month or so. Um, and we're, we're still watching very much closely the mail per labor hour that's driving the staffing and the hours. And I'm very pleased. I went, I go through that analysis with the food service director um, in the month of September every every fiscal year. And I'm very pleased with our mail per labor hour ratios and where they're at and the the progress that we've made four or five years ago to get that to a level that is kind of the industry standard or where we want to be. I think that's a big reason of why we, we're breaking even or were achieved a break even last year is where at every school at every level we're between 14 and 18 um, mail per labor hour and you know five or six years ago that was between eight and ten um, so I think we're, we're working to control the costs we're trying to do things to increase the revenue um, you know the breakfast program at the batch we're trying that out there's evidence that that's starting to work um, and those are the things I'll look to and um, you know, that's why I don't get too concerned over the, the amount at this early point in the season in terms of where we are in terms of the budget. Because in some, in some ways, we're budgeting. We're kind of like averaging out yeah. um, those costs over a period of time. And I know they're going to be a lot higher, just been a lot higher typically in September. Um, and they'll be lower later on. Um, so I think those are the trends we'll continue to look at and monitor. And the other thing with the food service program is we're up for another review, DESC uh, coordinated program kind of review. Um, it doesn't feel, it feels like just a year ago I was presenting that report, but shockingly that was almost three years ago where that happened, uh, three years ago from this coming spring. And then they now come out every three years, which was once every five years. So we um, are gearing up for that visit, which we haven't gotten the date of that visit, but I think we'll meet in January or February. Very good. I have a question. Did you pay extra for the paper? Um, you know what? I th that's exactly. We, we paid less for that paper. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a little issue with the we yellow. So they a little going on with, with the toner cartridge. The toner cartridge kind of ran, ran. A, we were this close, spray. Michael, to no one noticing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually thought we replaced all. It was, all it of was quite stuff. frustrating last week. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Hey, can they <laughs> squeeze those uh, cartridges yeah, for all you can get out? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, th th this is a great place to uh, deliver uh, uh, off-color. Um, it was a subtle way cartridge. of making the point. Yeah. That the that's right. There you go. <laughs> 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 but no, all good questions. Right. So. Um, all right. Uh, do you want to present the new? So I think within Michael's budget report, yeah, we were going to present the new right. booster group. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, right there. I do, yep. So... As is what has been our process, we haven't seen one of these maybe in, in, in several months, but um, I was notified at the start of the uh, athletic season that there was interest in a cheerleading um, support organization forming and developing. Uh, and I, I worked with, you know, I spoke to certainly Mr. Johnson and Ms. Roy, the, the, the coach, to, to make sure we got the necessary information. I attached the front cover sheet of their application um, but I think they've sort of really met the requirements. There's still some things they're working on, um, but I'm confident that they have a good, you know, organization and, and um, you know, platform in, in place. And I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable making a recommendation to the committee to officially recognize them or endorse them as a support group that will accept donations from on, in support of our cheerleader, cheerleading program. So we, we would be looking for a motion to approve, yes. I was just going to request. You know um, I, re I recommend that in adherence to school policy, school committee policy, LEC, North Reading School Committee vote to recognize the North Reading High School Cheerleading Boosters Club as a support group and authorize school administration to work collaboratively, 
collaboratively with the betterment of the North Reading Public Schools, for the betterment of the North Reading Public Schools. I'll second. All right. Any questions or concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. All right. And now we have a lot. All right, I'm I'm ready for them. I'm going to do Chairman, it. I added two tonight. Yes, I did okay, say that. So did you get those? Yes. Those came in after the packets were done. Okay. So, okay. You're going to put them in in the numerical order, correct? I'm going to. They were both I'm the same I'm amount. I'm fortunately. sticking the uh, uh, five hundred. Yeah. I'm sticking to the order that uh, I received <laughs> them in the packet. Okay. Wait, I got to switch glasses for that. Okay. I would just say before the first one, hundred dollars for a trombone. My my son is starting band. That is. Way less than the cost of a trombone. Would even, be. even a used one. <laughs> I, even and a used I, one. And I don't know if this is used or not. Hundred dollars for a used trombone. Before Rich reads these, there was one that the numbers did not match. At the very end there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was. I think it was supposed to be the two of them together. Maybe? It was the next to last. It's the last one, and it says seven three seven nine fifty three. And then in the narrative below, oh, yeah. it says three three seven nine five three. Three three seven. Is that somehow the total of the one before it? That's what I was wondering. No, this is different. Snap raise? Because the snap, that's for field hockey, the one before it. I don't know which one is the this right. Is girl. Because I said multiple through oh, snap raise as well. Yeah, but the 3,000 is right. All right. Um, I think it's a typo in the chart. So it's 337953? Three, 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 yes. seven, that nine. was the snap raise, and then there was an additional 200. Okay. I, I, I remember seeing in the check, and it was just 3,000. All right. I saw that. Too. All right. Are we ready? Madam Chair, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of a trombone valued at $100 to supplement the band instruments at the J.T. Hood Elementary, uh, J. T. J. Yeah, J. T. Hood Elementary School. Uh, the donor, Jennifer Kerwin. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I, vote, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $200 from Park Place Counseling to offset the costs associated with the 8th grade Washington, D.C. trip. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $325 from the North Reading uh, Music Boosters, Inc. to purchase several tuxedos for student use during choral concerts. Second. Any chance we can borrow those if yeah. any might fit us? If any, if any. <laughs> well, I want to know where they got several for, for three twenty-five. Exactly. Yeah, that, that was my, <laughs> my next the question. Same thing when I got it, I was. <laughs> <laughs> it must be more of a costumey kind yeah, of. Yeah, thing, yeah, right. So I've moved. Second. I think Diana seconded. Yep. Yeah. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude an interdepartmental transfer in the amount of $330 from the North Reading Recreation Department. This transfer is being made in consideration of the time volunteered by members of the high school volleyball team at North Reading's Youth Volleyball Summer Academy. That's excellent. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation totaling $500 from multiple families of all town chorus students toward the purchase of four trees for planting at each of the school campuses in North Reading. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,000 from Raytheon Corp awarded to the Hood Elementary School in recognition of a science teacher being a Massachusetts STEM Teacher of the Year finalist. Oh, that's which, uh, who, which was the science teacher? That the student we should name I think we honored her, right? Mrs. Yeah. Cleary, the kid. That's right. We, yeah. we did honor her. Right. Same, same uh, teacher. Same teacher. Same program. That's yes. awesome. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total do donation of $1,200 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association for the purpose of, of purchasing maker's space items. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Amazing. <clears throat> I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of books for North, North Reading students at all grade levels valued at $1,200 from Melconian's North Reading Subaru. Oh. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,420 from the North Reading Hall of Fame to cover the cost of a new ice maker, including installation and setup for the high school concession stand. Hmm. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $1,890 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association for the purposes, a purpose of purchasing smart board speakers. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $2,500 from Fit Revolution for the 2018 Hornet Hustle Road Race. The gift amounts are disseminated as follows, Batchelder Elementary 450, Hood Elementary 450, Little Elementary 700, Middle School 450, and the High School 450. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Just a quick question. Um, the little school? Most participants, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you. Again. I, I think, it, yeah, I think it is again, yeah. Again. Yeah, <laughs> again. Uh, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude the donation of 3,006. Uh, excuse me. We had it wrong. No, this is the next one. No, that's the next no, that's one. Oh, I apologize. The last one. Yeah. Sorry, Rich. Correct. Yeah. This one's correct. Okay. 3,000, uh, uh, with gratitude, a donation of $3,668.50 collected from SNAP Rays through online fundraising to offset the high school field hockey team expenses. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. So I'm, I actually, I'm gonna reverse what I said a minute ago. I went back and looked in the, the system and the seven, believe it or not, the 7,000 was, was correct. It is 7,000. All right. Seven, then it's a numeric order too. 7379, yeah. So I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $7,379.53 collected from SNAP raised through online fundraising and $250 from Catherine and Thomas Magner to offset the high school girls soccer team expenses. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 One thing I want to explain about this, just in case people don't know about the SNAP raise. That money is coming in through parents, friends, yeah. residents, <laughs> etc. It, I mean, it'd be interesting. I, I know that you have to enter a name, although I guess you can be anonymous on those. But so it's not a company called SnapRaise. Right. It's donating no, yeah. money. It's like a, go, it's a, like a right. GoFundMe. Right. It's like GoFundMe. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's an online fundraising. Yeah. Right. So it could have, be from someone. I, have asked that them, I don't always get it, but I've, I've tried to ask them to send me. There's a way they can send a. Print a, out. a print out, yeah, of all the people that, unless they were an anon, were anonymous, right? Yeah. An accounting and statement. So these two kind of, I, going forward, I'll try to, I'll get. I'll it'd be a lot of names. I don't think we want to read even them. If we don't want to read them, but maybe we could list. include in the wording of the motion, right. um, yeah. um, you know, from our from uh, friends and members of the community, right. or friends whatever. and family, yeah. or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, so I, I know there's just a way to, to get that. clarify it. Yeah, through the, through the system, and we can say as listed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Even if it says anonymous, at least we can. Um, the last two one that were added uh, that tonight, uh, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 from Integrated Benefits Group to support costs associated with North Reading Public Schools 2019 Parent University. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And finally, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 from Salem State University my alma mater, by the way, nice. to support costs associated with North Reading Public Schools October 2018 STEM yeah. STEAM Week. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. The generosity is just It's amazing. phenomenal. Yeah. I'm greatly going to oppose it because it was his school, but since it was a donation. <laughs> I was going to oppose it just because it was your school. Okay. But. <laughs> um, subcommittee updates. The finance planning team. Um, we met October 12th, and um, I believe we pretty much <coughs> just went over the Our meeting warrant. Yeah, mm. and there really wasn't a whole lot more discussed. I didn't bring my paperwork with. Yeah, no, that was the sum and substance of it. Yeah. Was the was the pine, um, town meeting warrant? Yeah, I'm really sad. I had a missed town meeting and the whole uh, yeah. sidewalk plow yeah, was that was no. discussion. Yeah, really was there was no sure revenue. Was Jerry was up there. <laughs> there was no revenue plan shared. There was not no discussion around that. Yeah. No. No, the only thing we we talked about, you know, preparing the budget, like the the structure of the budget next, you know, yes. uh, for the next couple meetings, but that's all. We didn't do anything else. All right, um, Mr. Webster. I was not present, so I oh, will. Oh, that's right, Mr. Go to Ms. Boutwell. Oh, okay. So I'll have to go to Mr. Bernard. I, I, I'm happy to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to put it in the report that I would. <laughs> um, so I think I gave um, a bit, of, uh, unfortunately, a bit of a disappointing uh, review of our inability to move forward with the um, sunshade sh structures 
dugouts, AKA dugouts at the softball field, given the cost, even though we would have had a nice contribution of labor from the vocational school students and teachers in the carpentry shop, but um, wasn't the cost, like cost 14, of the cost 14, of materials 000. was a little over fourteen thousand. Yeah, fourteen thousand one hundred and sixty dollars or something to that effect. So, so we're unfortunately we're not able to move forward with that. We talked um, a little bit about the um, uh, project that's going on with the um, infield at the baseball diamond, which looks like that's supposed to be done this week. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about that. We talked about maintenance. We had a tr we had a, another fertilizer application this past Saturday, um, following up on our multi-step treatment of the grass fields and surrounding areas that w that happened on Saturday. Um, we talked about winterizing the facilities down there, but we we were holding our breath a little bit because we're still using the lavatory, and we we might be hosting a football game again a week from Friday. Oh, that's right. This possibility of that on the on the uh, what would that be? I guess it would be the ninth right. of November. Yeah. So, how was that? Because we now we're into the non-playoff schedule, right. so we're traveling to uh, Melrose. We almost kind of go down. We traveled to Melrose this week, but we don't even know who we're playing next oh, week. Okay. The MIA will tell us after, after Friday. next Sunday, they'll tell there's us who a, we're playing. There's a possibility oh, okay. that we so could host. Oh, okay. Right. I forgot. Um, if we're the higher seed. It was a relatively short meeting. Um, well, because Mr. Webster wasn't there. I'm thinking and Ms. Boutwell wasn't there. Without, <laughs> without us. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> without the politicians. Think it was right, without the politicians, it was relatively short. I tried my best. <laughs> I mean, let me just, as I don't want to miss something that might have been, I mean, it was, the meeting was longer than. Did we have the I'm music at. boosters there? No. Okay. It was a miscommunication. They didn't get word that they were going to, they were invited to come. Okay. So I had Rita Mullen call them. They're coming in November. Okay. Um, we got Miss, uh, Mrs. Lazen on the phone, but she, okay, she couldn't, she couldn't do a conference call right. given her work. Okay. Um, but we did, we did make a commitment to hear Excellent. them. On, uh, on the November meeting. Okay. Uh, I have the agenda right here. Um, Michael reviewed a little bit about the, um, the anticipated um, rates for um, the swim facility at the YMCA and also um, where we were with the um, gymnastics co-op. We talked a little bit about hockey too, right? There was a meeting, yes. an informational meeting. It looks like we were anticipating possibly 10 players on the co-op um, ice hockey, correct? Yeah. That's going to be a so big, that's uh, that's an absolute, impact yeah. if it fall if it if it goes forward forward given the new policy on on the contribution of the fee so we'll 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 have more information for you at the right time but um, there was an informational meeting held on I want to say the 23rd of October and Mr. Johnson the athletic director reported to me he either texted me that night or the next day I think it was that night because I he did I texted right. you I mean, yes. And I think it was 10 that were at the meeting. So, so that's a, it's a good thing, and it's something. It's so a good my, thing, but it's something for us to keep an eye on. If it's 10, that's going to pretty much be bleed. It's about like 8,000. 8, yeah. 8,000 is my estimate. Is what that could that's going to pretty much bleed whatever balance we were going to have at but the But that's, that's year. right yeah. where we're at right now. I mean, it's a good yeah. it's, it's good. It's no, a good it's problem a good to problem, have, you know, but it's, it's something for us to keep an eye on. We'll have more information for it's you. It's still cheaper. It's still a lot cheaper than having our own... That's true. Girls hockey team, yep. which would cost and about thirty thousand dollars. And that was the agenda. Those were the, in the field maintenance, field maintenance, softball dugouts, gymnastics co-op, YMCA swim rental. The, Michael did an, a, a typical budget update, and the only other thing that was on there was the North Ready music boosters, but that got bumped to November. Is there any discussion of, again with Dave Johnson, of figuring out a way to try to raise funds for the dugout was enclosures? Not. No, that did not come up at the okay. meeting. And quite honestly. I think, I mean, I think, like we're not I think it, the hus has left the back. Right, we're not getting any progress. We've made our feelings right. known. It's, you know, we've asked. Right. I just, we're into it for two years now, and it's, yeah. I just. I agree. I don't. I thought the vocational school option was a good one. Yeah. And it was going to be a quality project. But, <clears throat> but I mean, we are talking about 30000 if we wanted to do both the dugouts and the school board. You're talking about $30,000 for the two of them with right. free labor, essentially. Right, with free labor, right. right. On the dugouts, yeah. So it's probably really like forty-five thousand all of that, right. you know, yeah. give or take. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the Norcam, Mr. Buckley. Yes. Uh, I didn't know we were all skipping our meetings this week, but okay. <laughs> I uh, so I went to Norcam. The one the one thing that related to schools, um, Rob is planning to attend an information session for the Mass Cultural Facility Fund in Salem on November fifth with the hope of finding some funds for the video infrastructure at the Performing Arts Center here. So apparently they give out grants, and so 
that's the only thing I think that related to the schools is he's going to go and try to get a grant to try and improve some of the video equipment or some of the video uh, infrastructure at the Performing Arts Center. The issue there is when the school was built. Um, All those years. I'll, ago. I'll try to put. I'll try to put it in the best way possible. <laughs> it was not built into the plans by others, not us, to have cable run directly through the walls, which is what we were expecting would have happened. So you would have had cameras, Mount. robotic cameras mounted on the walls that could have been operated with a remote control. So now all they have is they plug in their hand cameras. Yep. And it would have been, like, we have the remote cameras in here, which I think thanks to, to NorCam, we have remote cameras, and then the school worked together. Um, and we also wanted one in the gym mm. to broadcast games, but that didn't happen either. So I appreciate Phil doing that, see if we can get some grant I think, Rob, I think Rob's the one. Oh, Rob, that, that'd yeah. be excellent. Yep. But thought you'd like that. There was a CIPC meeting on the October 23rd that I did attend. Um, it was a so, reschedule. Uh, we, we, we haven't typically reported on those at the at this meeting. Yeah, I just noted that it's, um, if, if you, the meetings are just noted, so you don't do yeah, that. But, but, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to list no, it if, you, if you'd like to do that no, between the two to. of Honestly, you. Honestly, half the time it's not even school specific anyway. Okay. So I'll just bring it up when it is. Okay. That makes sense. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. So, so are you okay with that if I, if I don't list it, but you, yeah. if you interject on it, okay. Yeah. Um, Getting us our whole list. You want to hear about roads? <laughs> All you wanted to know about roads and more. <laughs> I wanted to show you that I actually showed up yeah. for a meeting this morning. <laughs> All right, upcoming subcommittee schedule. Uh, the CIPC meets November 7th at 4 p.m. at the Town Hall, Room 5. The Policy Subcommittee meets November 8th at 3.30 in the Superintendent's Office. The Financial Planning Team meets November 9th at 8.15 a.m. in the Superintendent's Conference Room. The NORCAM Board of Directors meets on November 15th at 7 p.m. at the NORCAM office. The Substance Abuse Coalition meets on November 27th at 10 a.m. at the North Reading Police Station. And the Athletic Subcommittee meets <coughs> November 27th at 12.30 at the Superintendent's Conference Room. And I would just add on November 1st, CPAC is hosting that. Okay, I, we, don't, we haven't typically listed them, just because I don't, I it's a well, saying, an I'm, event. I'm, I don't know if you want me to, okay. like, at the next one, do you want me to just say how it goes or anything that comes up from that or not? Well, I think that's the spirit of what, that's yeah, what you, yeah, you okay. just kind of report on that meeting. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Um, the administrative report, Mr. Bernard. So, Madam Chairman, I did have a few things I wanted to highlight for you, and you should have a report at your, at your um, station. Um, it's been talked about a little bit already, but uh, I, just, I do want to just offer a, 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 a little shout out for everyone that was responsible for making our first uh, STEAM night, um, I think a nice success last, last Wednesday. Um, Dan Downs, our Director of Digital Learning, whose work you have seen you know, in other ways, um, you know, whether it was the Digital Learning and Technology Plan, he's done quite a bit of work with the FIRST Robotics, Maple. Um, he really took the lead, um, along with Patrick Daly, um, but Dan really was, I think, the, the lead on, on, on coordinating our STEAM night. And we had a very good representation of teachers and students from kindergarten through um, grade 12, or elementary, I should say elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and it was just really, I think it was a nice event for the community. You know, when, you, when you're out on Main Street, and I thank the chairman for being, for coming, and I know some of you had conflicts in your schedule. But when you saw Main Street set up in the way that it was, it's just that's what that space was intended mm -hmm. to be for. And we've we've all seen other events there, but it just it was really neat. And then we had um, some keynote speakers from Amazon Robotics and from Fidelity Investments. And I think it was just an you know it was our first attempt at something like this as a district. But I think it's um, fair to say, much like Parent University, it was the first time we did it last year. But I think the feedback was so positive that you know we're looking to do something like that um, in the future. We also, just as a very quick, so I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the community for coming out. We had a lot of parents here, community members. We had a lot of students and teachers here. It was a nice event. We've also been talking a little bit about, in a very preliminary way, about just you know when you do these kind of showcase events, it's, um, for me at least, it kind of brings to the forefront of my thinking that, you know, it would be nice to do more of these things, but at the same time, I want to be mindful of not 
doing so much of the same thing that we run a little bit dry of that. So what Patrick and I talked about after, after Wednesday night was maybe on an annual basis we do something with a theme that is different year to year, but it's known as the night when people come out for a showcase of X. You know, it could be the arts, it could be, um, it could be science, it could be, um, it could be um, reading. You know, it could be something with a theme behind it. But it's, but there's, it's built as kind of a community district wide academic night. Um, so that's something that you know to maybe look forward to in the future with STEM and STEAM. I think it's a little bit different because it's. It's so all-encompassing in and of itself that, that we really like the idea of doing that on an annual basis. So it was a it was a nice there was a lot it was a nice event. Mm? There was a lot to see. There was a lot to see. What was really neat for me to see was the interest of the younger students seeing what's going on ahead of them, mm. what what's coming for them. You know, to see you know the fifth graders who did a little exercise with me and activity with me, which was hugely impressive with the iPads. But right across from them was something going on in a high school genetics class, you know, and to, to know that that's what they're heading for was, you know, they were asking questions. It was kind of cute to see. So, so a nice a nice event. Um, the app is out. Um, the app is available for download um, in the Apple Store as Capital NRPS um, or in an Android device as North Reading Public Schools. We released that just a week ago. I've had some good feedback on it. I will tell you that it is not. 100% of where I want it to be at this time, um, but we're, we're waiting for some additional content to be loaded, but I think you know there are some things that we're gonna be making as changes along the way, but certainly by now I think it's you know a good 90% where we hoped it would be. I was but hoping that the picture would be a big picture of you when it comes <laughs> up. That's the last thing you want on that. That's what I wanted to <laughs> see, to be reassured that everything was okay. <laughs> no, that it's legit? Yeah. That's <laughs> I sent the email. Oh, there's Mr. Bernard. There is. How many, how many have downloaded it so far? You know, I don't know. Is it, I don't know how to track that. I need to, I, I'd like to know it, You that, can. So. It's, um, yeah, because, because. I just don't know how to do that, but I would like to know. I I've bet asked, Michael. I bet I've asked Michael, yeah. yeah so that's, I, I would like to know. Yeah. I'd like to know where, you know, is it, I'm hoping it's more than, you know. Us. <laughs> I'm guessing a good I'm thinking it, it is. I've gotten some nice com comments back. I think it's really good. Yeah, it's um, kind of cool. So, and do you see a do you see a big uptick in traffic to a lot of the websites that are linked to it? Yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't looked. No. I'm sure there's a way to do that. I just I haven't. And just to understand what the use is and like. Yeah, yeah. I know. I it's like something that. I want to know. I want to know. Yeah. Are we, you know, I'd, I'd like never, to know how popular it yeah. is, but never we just we just haven't lunch. gotten there. Never knew where the lunch schedule was for the. Yeah, lunch. yeah, right. No, that's yeah. and I think and for having kids in school, the fact that it links directly to the Plus Portal, Plus Portal is a family big, ID and yeah. the ability to pay online. And you know, if you if you really if you good, take some time um, and look at that leading the nation button too, because there's a lot of good content in there about things that are going on in the schools just across the board. So that's it's funny to see you. Well, that I had a comment about. I so wish that Jerry was, was here because, right now. Because the, the format yeah. is not mobile friendly. Oh, okay. So, so you look, can't. It didn't look like that on mine. Yeah. You, this is, do you it, have apples? I have apples. Yeah. There is an yeah, apple. Oh, well, I did too. I don't remember looking So, at like, that. you can't really. Okay. You can't do anything with it once it loads. Oh, I, I didn't have that. Only, like, well, you only. You scroll up, I guess, and then it. Takes. You can scroll, but, like, only part, like, there's a tweet, but only half of it loads. If you scroll down. But see, Amy St. Arno's tweet, right? You got to go way down. Only half of it loads. Oh yeah, it's cut off. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all. Yeah. Our phones yeah. now for the rest of the meeting. Don't you wish Jerry, don't you wish Jerry was here right yeah, now? Yeah, Jerry. Yeah. I think Jerry, he has a droid, doesn't he? he has yeah, Jerry. Has an Android you, Jerry's flip phone would really have a problem displaying the app. Okay, so it's out, you know, we're, again, like it's I good said, though. we're, we're it's kind of, you know, we, we still need some, and that's this is, the, you know, I, yeah. Michael doing my uh, data testing, uh, beta testing, excuse me. Beta, yeah. Uh, okay. Parry University, I had told you at the last meeting that we had a, so I had a very good planning meeting on October 25th. Some good interests, some, a lot of, I had a, lot, a number of new folks um, at the meeting looking to, to run some workshops, so I'm excited. You saw our first donation come in. Tonight for $500 from uh, Integrated Benefits Group, Tony Mafio of North Reading, and uh, just remind you that last year we ran that event um, strictly through donation. No, no, um, no budgetary funds were used to to run um, Power University, and that's my intent again this year. Is, is the goal to keep it about the same size as last year, same number of offerings? Um, I don't have. Bigger, smaller, you, know? you know, I'm, I'm I don't think I'm there yet with what I know I'll have, but I, I'm not. I think we're we're looking at a similar format, like three concurrent workshop mm -hmm. opportunities plus the information pavilion on Main Street, but the number of workshops I don't have a preconceived you know limit on, 
on, on what the number would be. I don't expect it will get unwieldy, but I, yeah. you know, I think it's reasonable. But I would, I would expect it to be somewhere where we were yeah. last year with maybe you know plus or minus a little bit. And then I just, I, th I thought it was important to inform you, and this, and I want to just be very careful that you know this is very much a very preliminary discussion right now around um, school start times. But as as some of you know, this has been a subject that's come up a few times over the last dozen or so years. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, at times we've been asked to engage in conversation, at other times we've asked other people to engage in conversation, and I think we, and I'm saying we because it's really, I think Patrick, Michael, and I are the ones that are going to take a first meeting now with some parents that seem to have an interest in kind of, you know, opening up a conversation again around um, examining our current school start times and, you know, what, 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 what changing those might look like and what is the feasibility of even doing something like that. So. We're, we're looking to set up a meeting. I think we have a date of uh, November 15th, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Just to kind of a, an initial you know preliminary comment. We're kind of limiting that right now to a couple of parents that have reached out to us. So we're not making that a, a broad. Yeah, meeting. but I was just because but it's, it's, they yeah, were liaising, for you, it's, for you, it's, liaising with I'm me. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about <laughs> others. We're meeting with a with a small okay, group right so now. Just I'll just talk to you about when. Uh, but you, you can come. It's, yeah, no, yeah. it's November 15th at 5 o'clock. <laughs> All right. I just, so it's, we're, meeting in my me we're meeting in my office. He doesn't so. go to meetings anymore. <laughs> no, that's right. I'm I wasn't speaking about you. I just don't want it to be. That's why I say I went out into this at the outset saying it's a very early, you know, we're in very much in the discussion stage as, as this Yeah, is and, they, and they're well aware that it's a long-term. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's good. That it they, is. You know, so we, we were happy to take the meeting, and I, I asked Michael to, um, to, to try and join us too, which he was able to accommodate in the schedule because there were, you know, as the conversation goes on, if in fact it does go on, you know, there's there's some logistical things that you know Michael has a a, a skill set to, to. Well, he also has, has some good insight to add, being in a uh, coaching in a conference that where half the schools have a later start he time. Does. And yeah, he does. So he can bring some of that to the table year, too. Right, this year, yeah. but the whole thing's about transportation, right. busing, bell schedules, what the implications are, right. food service, all of that are are things that over time would yeah. probably become. Um, you know, discussion items. So I thought it was important. You know, I, I on a subject such as that, you, I don't want the committee to hear about you know something and think, well, you know, where is this going? I'm telling you where it's going. It's very, very early, but we're we're going to have a, a you know a conversation in mid-November, and I expect some you know subsequent work and conversation after that. So more just an FYI for you tonight. I, I think I mentioned uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, there was a. Uh, Presentation on on school start times at the summer institute. I went to the um, that uh, MASC the MASC yeah. and um, the one one of the big takeaways I took from that was that it's happening a lot in the state. Um, that so there we may be uh, just at the, and again you're right. This is a long conversation, but we may be at you know at a moment where a lot of districts around us may be having beginning those same conversations. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. How was the summer institute? Other, other things were there other topics? Um, worth that was very learning? interesting. Um, now you're. This is, <laughs> this is now what four months away. I'm a really. <laughs> I have a hard time pulling that out of my memory. But uh, there was a couple of really interesting. Uh, one was on um, restorative justice. Um, the concept of of. Uh, uh, Having a, a, a program, a, a program of enforcing rules in the school where where you're not, you know, immediately punishing. You're trying to get them to do restitution of one kind or another. Uh, it's you know, it was it was very interesting, led by an expert on that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, there was a, there was a bunch of interesting stuff. And of course, the net, just talking to other school committee members is always interesting. I'll share the. I'll tell you. I'll be more specific about that. But it was interesting. Well, you and I should probably meet for our subcommittee too. At some we point. definitely <laughs> we have work to do. I'm yeah. sure we have work to do. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, future business. Before you do that, oh. I, I know that you um, guys, had t folks, talked at the last meeting about something that I wanted to to talk about tonight briefly, which is oh, yeah. um, one. Please, everybody, vote on Tuesday. But two, um, question three is uh, important to me, and it's important because I'm proud of this school system because. We were at, at the um, um, kind of early stages of implementing um, protections and rights for transgender students at our school. 
and it, two of us on the board and Mr. Bernard uh, were at a meeting one night where we took a lot of heat for that. And uh, I just hope everybody um, supports question three, which is to preserve uh, transgender rights and access. So um, it's just important to me because I know that I, I, we as a school district are kind of on the cutting edge of giving transgender gender students those rights. And I know we're still doing that today. We so. are. And, and Thank you for bringing that up. No and if I may add to that, I, I, you know, I would want to state that regardless of the results of question three, you know, that won't change the policies of this district. Right, we don't have to change, right. Yeah. So, so the, those policies that are there uh, to provide accommodations to all will, will remain, I believe. Many colleges, I, I saw there was an announcement today, I think it was from a number of colleges that said regardless of the results, they're going to continue. Yeah with their current policies of uh, equal access, et cetera. So I just went, but the key thing is everybody vote, please. Go vote, vote early. It's early, it's so much fun, yeah. early. so easy. <laughs> I won't say often, vote early, that's it. I don't wanna cause any problems, but thank you. All right, thanks, Mel. Um, future business, our next meeting will be held November 19th at 6.30 here in the Distance Learning Lab then on December 3rd at 6.30, and, but this one will be at the Hood School in the, oh, um, in the cafeteria. And then on December 17th um, at 6.30, and it will be here in the Long Distance Learning Lab. Just Distance Learning Lab, not Long Distance. Jerry called it Long Distance. <laughs> <laughs> you must have picked that up from him. Poor Jerry. Probably. Poor Jerry. <laughs> I think we've mentioned Jerry about 18 know, times we tonight. <laughs> we mentioned Jerry's name more than when he was here. No. <laughs> okay. If there's he doesn't watch anymore, so we should see how, right. how much we can say without him realizing. True. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Good night.